Welcome to this special discussion of Keep the Faith. I am Father John Paracone. I am a professor of philosophy at St. Francis College in Brooklyn. I am a resident at St. Agnes in New York City and am director of Christi Fidelis, a, a local organization of lay people where I try to offer doctrinal and ascetical formation for their benefit. With me today in our discussion are uh, a panel of very distinguished guests. Immediately to my left is Father Clarence Kelly. Father is the... Um, Father Head, the traditional chapel, the St. Pius V Chapel in Oyster Bay, and uh, is the head of the St. Pius V Society. To my right is Father Brian Harrison. Father Brian Harrison is the chairman of the Department of Theology at the Catholic Pontifical University of Puerto Rico in Ponce. Uh, Father Harrison is also the Sensei de Borum for that diocese. Again to my left, Count Neri Capone. Count Capone has a very impressive curriculum. Uh, he is Vice President of Una Voce International. He's a judge in the Ecclesiastical Matrimonial Tribunal of Tuscany. He was a former Assistant Professor of Canon Law at the University of Florence a former advocate of the sacred Roman Roga. And finally, but not least, Father Jenkins, who is at the St. Gertrude's Academy in Cincinnati, Ohio, and also a member of the Society of St. Pius V. Since our discussion today will involve questions of very serious uh, sensitivity, regarding the unusual predicaments that Catholics find themselves since the close of the Second Vatican Council, I'm going to restrict myself to a prepared text and very precisely formulated question for the sake of precision and absolute clarity, which after all, the end of this discussion, the final goal, to shed more light and illumination on difficulties that plague the consciences of Catholics throughout the world. We here at Keep the Faith will hope that this videotape will encourage a broader conversation, uh, of greater illumination, and hopefully we will all grow together in the virtues as well. According to some in traditionalist circles, one of the causes of the disputes among those who otherwise agree on major points regarding a crisis in the church is that while we agree that there is a problem and that we therefore must avoid this parish or that catechism, there is a difficulty on the theoretical level, justifying what we are doing on a practical level. That is how it is that a holy Catholic church can allow or seemingly encourage practices that are not holy and Catholic. Some areas of particular concern all of us have. The promulgation of the new right of mass and the new ordinal. The new code of canon law, which among other things allows communion to non-Catholics. The widespread granting of annulment. Several theories have been advanced to explain this widespread falling away and the failure to stem the defection. Several theories, which according to one view, the modernists and liberals have infiltrated the church since the Second Vatican Council, sabotaging what would have otherwise been a genuine revitalization of the church. Others consider that the Pope himself is partially to blame, having been persuaded by new ideas himself and being too lenient with the enemies of the church. Still others going further claim that the leadership itself is absent. That is, that the see of St. Peter is vacant. The theory of a vacancy or sadificantism has been discussed only hypothetically for centuries, but in our very own day, it still occasions some debate. Recently, Father 
Alfonso Sutton, a theologian from Rome and a writer in, Italia, in an Italian journal published in English as Christ of the World, felt moved to comment on this particular growing problem. Father Sutton considered the question from several standpoints, namely, number one, could a true pope ever teach as true what is false and mandate others to believe it? To this, Father Sutton answers a resounding no, in accordance with constant church teaching and scriptural foundation. Number two, could the pope become a heretic privately, though outwardly maintaining Catholicism? In answer, Father Sutton argues that while this is a theoretical possibility, according to the majority opinion, the man in question would remain Pope. And thirdly, could a Pope once validly in office lose that office by publicly and persistently promoting what is false? This also is theoretically possible, but as with the above, the same thing to recognize it as a hypothetical possibility advises that we should assume that it would never happen. Well, the two latter questions, Father Sutton refers to St. Robert Bellarmine and St. Alphonsus Liguria, two doctors of the church. I would like to begin this discussion panel with the following question. Do we all acknowledge that Pope John Paul II <coughs> is the true successor of St. Peter. And I would like first to initiate the discussion by Father Kelly. Well, before we talk about the status of John Paul II, I'd simply like to make the point uh, that uh, I was consecrated a bishop by Bishop Alfred Mendez on October the 19th, 1993, and that there is sufficient, adequate, and even abundant proof to demonstrate that fact. So as you would insist upon calling me Father Kelly, I would just like to let it know that uh, I am a Catholic bishop ordained by a Catholic bishop. Now you may, and most likely, I'm quite sure, think that it was an illicit act, and you may be opposed to the fact that it happened, uh, and even to addressing me as, uh, as a bishop. But I just wanted to make that point. Uh, with regard to the status of John Paul II, in my personal opinion, I do not think that he is the Vicar of Christ. And the reason I do not think he is the Vicar of Christ, among other reasons, <clears throat> is because it is impossible for a Vicar of Christ to promulgate a universal law for the Church, which is either country to faith or morals. And the promulgation of the new Code of Canon Law, specifically Canon 844, as you mentioned in your notes, uh, or will mention later on, contains a provision which provides for giving Holy Communion to heretics and schismatics. Uh, it is true that it says they have to believe the teaching of the Catholic Church on the Eucharist, but they could theoretically, according to that particular canon, they could, for example, deny the Immaculate Conception, the doctrines of the Church concerning the papacy. They could even be in favor of artificial contraception and homosexuality. And according to the provision of that particular code, uh, that the particular canon, they could actually receive Holy Communion, if the priest giving them Holy Communion determines that they are worthily receiving it. So, to my mind, that it's not a possibility that the Vicar of Christ on earth uh, could promulgate a universal law for the Church, and that law be contrary to faith or morals, and that particular canon clearly is contrary to what the Catholic Church has always held and taught down through the centuries. The Holy Eucharist is a sacrament of unity. Uh, it it, uh, it contains two realities. One reality is our Lord himself, and the other is the mystical body of Christ. And to propose that you can give Holy Communion to those who are members of heretical sects, schismatic sects, is just oh, completely contrary. It's, it's a different gospel, as St. Paul said. And so to me, I do not see how the successor of St. Peter could promulgate such a law. Brother Harrison? Well, um, in the first place, in reply to what, just to make clear the question of terminal, I'm quite happy to call Bishop Kelly Bishop Kelly, but I'd like to clarify my position on that. From what I've seen, I don't, haven't seen any reason to doubt the validity of the consecration carried out by Bishop Mendez, a Puerto Rico, retired bishop from Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. But as Bishop Kelly, and so I believe he is, I presume he is a validly consecrated bishop with the sacramental powers of a bishop, 
but as he also already pointed out, and he rightly presumed that those in our position do not accept the, the legitimacy of that act, it would be an illicit consecration because it was done without papal mandate. And in saying that, of course, I also imply and I state that I, of course, do accept John Paul II as the true successor of Peter. Now, in regard to the point that Bishop Kelly has raised about the new code of canon law, the first point that I think needs to be made is that John Paul II was certainly not the first pope to approve of the giving of Holy Communion to non-Catholics under certain exceptional and rare circumstances. Even before the new code was promulgated in 1983, this had been the uh, approved practice in exceptional circumstances, and modifications to the 1917 code had been made in the meantime. And it Do you was mean before Vatican II? Yes, before Vatican II. For instance, when I was, the, the, um, if I'd had a little more notice about this forum beforehand, I might have been able to research, get out the actual documentation. I, I only knew about this a couple of days ago, and I, when I came up from Puerto Rico, so I didn't have time to prepare for it as well as I might have or would have liked to. But I do remember that in my canon law course in seminary in Australia in 1981, given by the um, president of the Canon Law so Society of Australia, a very knowledgeable canonist, and uh, that was just before the new code, a couple of years before the new code was promulgated, but already the accepted uh, practice was that in certain modifications that had been introduced, Count Caponica as a canonist could uh, say a lot more about that. But one thing I do remember specifically was that our professor told me that, and I, we had the documents back then, uh, and I, I could look it up if I had the time, but, it, but back in the time of Pius XII, the first exception to the ancient tradition of never giving non-Catholics holy communion under any circumstances, the first exception to that rule was in the time of Pius XII, around right about the early years of World War II, when the Holy Office uh, gave a response permitting Holy Communion to be given to separated Oriental Christians, or like Eastern Orthodox, or other separated Oriental churches, in danger of death, who, uh, who asked for the sacrament. Uh, even if they did not um, express any uh, intention of becoming Catholic. Now, this was a derogation for the 1917 Code, which definitely did not permit that, but an exception, a change was introduced as early as about 1940. And so, if we're going to say that uh, John Paul II is not a true Pope for allowing an exception to that rule, then would we also have to say that Pius XII is not a pr true Pope? Um, That's not what I said, though. In other words, if Pius XII allowed giving Holy Communion to members of non-Catholic sects, he would have committed a grave crime. Okay. But if he made it a law for the Church, a universal law for the Church, that puts it in a completely different category. In other words, the Pope obviously is not impeccable. He can personally commit sin, and he can even sanction the commission of sin by others. So if in fact that's true, and personally I don't think it is true, but if it is true, Pius XII would have committed a terrible sin. But what John Paul II has done is he has made that evil a part of the universal law of the Church, which necessarily involves sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament and, and the promotion of the heresy of religious indifference. Well, now, I don't There's a difference on the, on the question of if Pius XII did that, which I don't believe he did, but if he did it, that would be his sin. If he made it a law for the universal church, then you run into another question. Well, then, if I may, would you, yeah. Count, Count Caponi, can you give us some clarification? Obviously, obviously such, a, uh, such a decision by the Holy Office amounts to a law for the universal church. It is a modification of the code. Yes, yeah, so this is published by the Holy Office. This is more than, this is more than a, a personal sin on the part of Pius XII. And Father Harrison informed me that yes. this had happened, just as I was informed that by somebody else these days, I forget now whom, that uh, Pius, under Pius IX uh, in 1870, uh, of the uh, extreme um, um, anointing of the sick and, uh, and uh, the sacrament of penance could be uh, accorded to schismatics. Count on this question, the first one that we're considering, do we acknowledge Pope John Paul II as the true successor of St. Peter? Could you elaborate your position here? Of course I recognize John Paul II as uh, uh, legitimate success. In the light of 
Bishop Kelly's objection? Well, uh, the, uh, this is a question that concerns uh, the church discipline. And I should say, but here, of course, uh, Father Pericone, you realize that I'm entering the realm of theology where I'm not competent, where Father uh, Harrison is more In my very modest view as a non-theologian, may I say that the sacrament of the Eucharist is truly, yes, a sacrament of unity, but it is also a medicinal sacrament. Therefore, it heals. It's, uh, these two, these two uh, purposes of the Eucharist ought to be balanced, and also the healing element taken to, in, into account. Uh, it's true that there may be a conflict. Uh, one, one has to balance the two. That is, but I'm, I'm speaking as a non-theologian, for God's sake. To, to complete the circle of discussion, Father Jenkins, can you give your position on this question, and then we'll just open it to some debate. As Father Perico and I consider John Paul's status to be very doubtful. And I consider his status to be doubtful because, uh, in my own case, I think the, the gravest question that applies to what Bishop Kelly said before, but I think it's rooted in his concept of what the Church is. I think the uh, changes that have taken place since Vatican II uh, indicate a, uh, a transformation in the understanding of the nature of the Church, into something that is totally alien. Uh, I think Cardinal Benelli said it well to Dr. Eric de Sethentham, uh, when Cardinal Benelli told him some years ago, it must be 20 years ago now, that the difference between the, the traditional Mass, the old Latin Mass, and the new Mass is a difference in ecclesiology. And as you know, that involves the very concept of what the Church is. And uh, Dr. de Sabinton's answer was, uh, Your Eminence, what you've said is, is an enormity, he said, which is true. And uh, just reading um, the writings of John Paul right up to the present day, including Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and uh, the New Catechism, which just came out, it's, it's obvious that he has a very, a very gaseous, nebulous concept of what it is to belong to the Church. So the 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 borders uh, demarcating you know the lines of where the church is and where the church is and who is in and who is not in the church uh, are very very unclear and he does not identify the Roman Catholic Church uh, with Christianity um, and with the true Church of Christ he says the uh, the what is it uh, the church subsists in the Catholic Church. Uh, that's a very indefinite term, and I think it is advisedly, deliberately indefinite, because it leaves a very broad interpretation as to what constitutes the Roman Catholic Church. I think he's kind of a, a pan-Christian. Therefore, are we to understand, Bishop Kelly, that you and Father Jenkins caught a bit on this question? Father no, I think Bishop Kelly was just uh, giving a specific... Well, no. In other words, I know I am not competent to render any judgment as to the definitive resolution of this question. I'm just giving my opinion that I cannot see how it is possible for the Vicar of Christ to promulgate a universal law for the Catholic Church which is unholy and which is contrary to Catholic teaching. So, so in other words, and law, for example, the Code of Canon Law is protected it is a secondary object of infallibility, and it is also protected because of the holiness of the Church. In other words, the Catholic Church is holy, and if you follow what the Catholic Church teaches, you will become holy, and you will save your soul. But if you follow what Canon 844 teaches, you will be promoting sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament and the heresy of religious indifferentism. So I'm, what I'm saying is, I do not understand, I do not see how it is possible for a Pope to do that, because the Church is holy, and therefore, my opinion is that he is not the Pope. At least he is a doubtful Pope. His status is that of a uh, contested Pope. So, Bishop Kelly, when you marry Holy Mass, do you uh, include John Paul II's name on, uh, when, when it's time to say that the name of the Pope? I do not. You I do not. not. Pope Jenkins? I do not. You do not. May, I, ask, may I say something that I omitted to say before? That at least as a as an uh, as a lawyer, I mean, uh, I don't presume to enter the realm of theology. Uh, I, uh, I I wanted to make it clear that what is altered uh, after Vatican II is uh, what we call the presumption of law. Before Vatican II, it was presumed 
hope that uh, anybody who was a heretic or a schismatic was in bad faith until proof to the contrary. We now presume, uh, knowing more about human nature, we presume that he is in good faith until proof to the contrary. Obviously, if he's in good faith, there's no question of sacrilege, I should say. Father Harrison, <coughs> Father Jenkins brought up this famous problem of the death of this, of this uh, problem of subsist in, in regard to the church. Could you give some... Well, before we get on to ecclesiology, I think we should try to clarify a little bit more this question of giving holy what the new code of canon law says about that because that's the we haven't really covered all bases on that yet i think bishop kelly goes too far in his uh, condemnation of this change and i don't think that we can draw any conclusions from that about the supposed inauthenticity of john paul ii as pope now the reason i say this is because in order to stop being Pope, he would have to be guilty of formal heresy. Now, to be a formal heretic, both the old code and the new code say pretty much the same thing. You have to deny or doubt, or pertinaciously, not just sort of once or twice in, from ignorance or something, but you have to be repeatedly, stubbornly denying, or at least withholding assent from a truth which has been proposed by the magisterium of the church as revealed by God, that means divine and Catholic faith, revealed by God and proposed by the church as such. Now, it seems to me that although it's unquestionable that until relatively recently, whether it was 1940 or 19, whatever, it's certainly true that previous to this, uh, the last half century, say, we're all agreed that the church never did give permission for Holy Communion to be given to non-Catholics under any circumstances. But that's a very different, different thing from saying that prior to 1940 or whatever it was, or 1980, the magisterium of the Church had taught as divine and Catholic faith, as revealed truth, that under no circumstances can Holy Communion be given to a non-Catholic. We have to distinguish between, you know, what the practice of the Church was, what the law of the Church was, and what the divinely revealed doctrine, if such there be on this point, uh, was. Now, um, another point that I'd like to make is that the, co the, consens the traditional consensus of theologians was that the Church's universal law, such as a code of canon law, cannot impose any law which is intrinsically evil, a, a law which is for instance, that kind of thing, intrinsically opposed to divine and Catholic faith. But there's no guarantee that every law promulgated by the universal church is always going to be the best and wisest possible law. There's no guarantee that a law promulgated by the universal church may not have some harmful effects. Um, the very fact that the church's laws have changed so constantly, so frequently over 2,000 years, shows that from time to time popes have decided well the existing law is is um, inadequate it's uh, having harmful effects it's not promoting as well as it should be the salvation of souls and holies let's change the law and of course there have been many changes in in the laws of the church over two thousand years and so we're not obliged to hold that um, no pope no true pope can ever promulgate a universal law which might be unwise in some respects, which might have some harmful effects. All that the traditional consensus of theologians held, and this, was, this itself was never defined by the magisterium, but it was certainly the, the common teaching, and I accept it myself, that the Holy Spirit, the holiness of the Church, would prevent the Pope from ever imposing, at the level of the universal Church, a law which, which was intrinsically contrary not just per accidents, but per se, contrary to revealed truth. Now, I, am, uh, I see no evidence at all that the traditional magisterium of the Church had laid down as a matter of divine and Catholic faith, as revealed truth, that never can there be any exception made uh, so as to give communion to a, a non-Catholic in, ex in, in, in extraordinary circumstances. It was not the practice, certainly, but neither had it been proclaimed as revealed 
truth that this could never under any circumstances be done. And therefore I see no reason at all in this question of the new code and Holy Communion to doubt the authentic stays of John Paul II. Do you believe in the indefectibility of the Catholic Church? Of course. If John Paul II incorporated into the Code of Canon Law that the Catholic Church was not indefectible, would you say that he promulgated the law that was intrinsically unacceptable? He hasn't promulgated it. If that. he did. Well, I have no reason to say what would be the case if he did something which he is certainly not going to. I mean, let, let, let's... Well, the reason let, I'm saying it is well, because the indefectibility of the Church is not de fide. Well... It's not de fide. But if he got up and said the Catholic Church is not indefectible, you would say that he doesn't have the Catholic faith. In other words, what we must believe as Catholic Catholics extends far beyond what is specifically speaking de fide. In fact, the infallibility of the Church extends far beyond of course. what is divinely revealed. But that's For example, there are things that are divinely revealed and that are held to be divinely revealed which have never been infallibly taught. But you can't deny those things. Yes, you're quite right, but so my point is that... incorporate them into the law. My point is, though, that to, de that to deny those things which are revealed but have not yet so far been mm -hmm. proposed by the Universal Church's Magisterium to be revealed, to deny those things is not heresy, but, prox but say, it's proximate to heresy. It's a, it's a theological censure less than heresy to define. For instance, to so define... But as, I take as something as from sacred scripture. True, though, right? It's infallible, but, but, but not every infallible truth is proposed as de fide divina et catholica. It's right. not, not every truth. But, but you ha that's the kind of truth you have to, def to deny or doubt in order to be a heretic, and that's not, the kind of truth that John Paul II would have to deny in, in order to, for, to be any kind of a case that he is not a true pope. I think you actually changed the subject. And the reason I say that is what I said was that what was contained in the Code of Canon Law is contrary to Catholic faith and morals. Well, I don't accept that it is contrary to Catholic faith and morals. What is, what is contained in the Code of Canon Law we have now? Right. You believe that it is perfectly reconcilable with the Catholic faith to give Holy Communion to someone who doesn't believe in the papacy, the Immaculate Conception, the intrinsic uh, sinfulness of artificial contraception. You believe that it's perfectly reconcilable with the Catholic faith to give such a person communion. I believe it's not contrary to what has been revealed, what has been proposed by the churches of divine and Catholic faith. I have my doubts, as do many Catholics who accept the legitimacy of John Paul II, I have my doubts as to whether that is a wise and prudent law. If, if that, that law had never been cha changed, and if it had been an absolute no exceptions, I'd be perfectly happy. I certainly have my doubts as to whether this is a wise and prudent modification in the law, but I certainly don't hold that it is intrinsically contrary to divine and Catholic faith, and therefore I cannot, cannot see how it could possibly call in question the authentic status of the Pope. Do you think it's intrinsically Pope. evil? Pardon? Do you think it's intrinsically evil? No, I don't think it's intrinsically evil. I, th I, th I think it's, you could make out a very good case that it's unwise and that it could lead to uh, you know, extension and more and more abuse, but I don't think it's intrinsically evil, no. Father Jenkins, do you have something to add? Well, Father Perricone, there are many things that a Catholic would never do, would consider to be mortally sinful, that have never been specifically condemned by the Church, as contrary to our faith and morals. For example, the Church has never issued a decree saying it is, uh, it is against Church law, let's put it that way, it is against Church law to give Holy Communion to a cat, Obviously, this is something that has never been said. Um, the fact is, though, that if, if someone were to do that, if a priest were to do that, as I understand one priest in Florida did give communion to a dog not long ago, um, this would be a horrible crime, a terrible sacrilege. And uh, in the old code of canon law, of course, he would be uh, censured automatically, excommunicated, um, and uh, in the most special way reserved to the Holy See. Uh, what we're dealing with here are higher principles than with regard to the administration of the Holy Eucharist. And uh, if someone contravenes those principles which are defined by the Church, then certainly one would be at least suspect of heresy. What we have at stake here in giving Holy Communion to non-Catholics is the very integrity of faith, the very nature of the Church, the very notion of, who, uh, of what supernatural faith is. And... Uh, as uh, Count Capone mentioned, we, we've changed our presumptions, uh, evidently, since Vatican II, and we're presuming goodwill, whereas the old code used to presume badwill. But
We, we uh, risk and, in fact, give grave scandal in doing so because this, the notion of all this is that uh, there is uh, there's a trade-off in doing so. You, you undermine the very notion of supernatural faith in doing so. Um, if uh, faith is, in fact, that uh, supernatural virtue by which one believes what God has revealed on the authority of God revealing, then if one believes, say, six of the twelve articles of the Apostles' Creed, he does not have the virtue of faith. And one might say, well, we think this person means well. We think he has a pure heart. As the New Mass says, all who seek you with a sincere heart. Whatever, but that does not necessarily incorporate one to the Roman Catholic Church, nor does it necessarily, nor does my personal presumption that this man means well, and he's just mistaken, mean that he can publicly receive Holy Communion. The message that this sends to Catholics around the world is that the faith is negotiable, and it really doesn't matter. You get right down to it. Don't you think Father Harrison has a point, Father, in saying that the mind of the legislator in that canon is not as malignant as, as you might think in far more benign, and certainly doesn't communicate formally heresy, though, as we would all agree, it certainly does give way to the possibility of grave scandal. Especially in, in the present age. In the present age. And confusion. But, but it is in a grave scandal. In law, I, I would, it, it is intrinsically evil to do what that canon uh, allows. Well, as I said, I don't agree. I think it's going too far. And also, I don't agree with the idea that a person, let's say, of another denomination, Eastern Orthodox, or it is, who doesn't hold all the articles of faith, cannot have the virtue of faith, because we have to distinguish between, as I'm sure we're all well aware here, between formal and material heresy. A person can be sincerely in ignorance of a certain truth of faith um, without being maliciously denying that faith. Now, a person who, the Eastern Orthodox don't believe in the Immaculate Conception, for example, I don't think we can say that no Eastern Orthodox believer has the, the supernatural virtue of faith, because we cannot, if, if that person has the disposition to accept and believe what God reveals, but he or she doesn't know, through invincible ignorance, that God has in fact revealed the Immaculate Conception, that person can still have the, vir the subjective virtue of faith and be only in material heresy. So I don't think you can say that uh, this is this uh, concession of the new canon law is going so far as to sort of sell out or sell the faith. You know? right, but Father, law governs the external acts of man. You're talking about something internal. You're talking about a personal judgment about this person's hidden disposition. But you were saying. But if someone was saying they're saying the virtue of faith, I'm saying judgment about their it is theoretically subjective. possible. Yeah. It is theoretically possible if someone does have the virtue of faith, but through ignorance. Uh, does not believe this or that doctrine of the Catholic Church. I know that, but can the Church, uh, can the Church actually proceed on the basis? Can the Church tell her priests, go ahead, you make your subjective decision as to whether this person does have the virtue of faith but doesn't believe the doctrines of the Church? And this is where we cross that line where the, the lines of what the Church is become terribly blurred. And eventually the Church just evaporates altogether. You know, about a couple of years ago, uh, when Nelson Mandela was running for president in, uh, South Africa, he was publicly given Holy Communion by a Nova Soto bishop there. No, that, that was a and I know you wouldn't agree with that. Of course not. But this is the kind of thing that this canon okay, engenders. This is why, this, all right, but this, this is why I said you have to distinguish between something which is intrinsically contrary to the law of God and something which can open the way for scandals. Now, I'm quite happy to accept that uh, this new legislation, unfortunately, in the light of experience, is doing just that. But that's still a long way from, from demonstrating that it is intrinsically contrary to revealed truth. I, do I, don't, I don't think you've, you've demonstrated that. And, and, and also another point here, who decides? Now, who has the, it's obviously a difficult point, you know, and who decides? The fact is that the Pope is the supreme legislator in the Catholic Church. And in this case, we're talking about a Pope who was recognized as Pope not only by myself and Father Perico and Count Capone, but by all of the cardinals of the, of the Roman Church, of the virtual, not complete, but almost complete unanimity of the bishops of the world. So, you know, we're, we're looking at a very broad consensus here. And, it, and, and if the, during the, the formation of the new code of canon law, 
the obviously people had to go uh, the experts appointed by the Pope had to study with great care the question of can we make an exception for giving Holy Communion to non-Catholics and they, they, they went into this obviously they decided after carefully that this does not contradict anything absolutely essential to the Catholic faith the Pope gave it his approval he is the one who has the authority to decide and uh, I think that uh, once we start saying that each individual can decide you know um, what is and what isn't divine and Catholic faith when the church herself has never came out and, and, and clearly uh, decided this matter by her supreme magisterium we're getting in danger of another kind of sort of reverse Protestantism if our private judgment becomes the supreme criterion. The Father, the, the universal standard of the church's traditional judgment say, concerning giving Holy Communion to non-Catholics prior to, I think you'd agree, 1940 at least is that it would have been a grave crime, that it would have been condemned as sacrilege, that a priest who dared to do so would have been censured very severely for doing this. This was the universal practice of the Church from the beginning. Uh, but I do have a question for you, by the way, about Nelson Mandela. Do you know for a fact that Nelson Mandela does not believe in the real presence? I don't know what Nelson... Mandela's so we, we should beliefs. presume then that since that bishop gave him communion, that that bishop had some evidence that this man, Nelson Mandela, believed in the real presence and was perfectly justified in giving him Holy Communion. How could you condemn it? No, 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 because as well as believing, according to the canon, canon law, as well as believing in the real presence, uh, this is not the only requirement. It has to be... I don't have the code of... Do we have a code if of... If I remember, remember rightly, well, look, yes. does, if I remember a... rightly, I think it is remoto scandalo is in, in, uh, um, obviating the danger of indifferentism and error. So it has to be a very private thing. Yes. In, and, and, in extremis, the person is dying, things like that. I mean... And, and doesn't really, he have to have no access to a minister of his own church? No access to the minister of well, his own church. This was obviously not the case so of the Mandela. Of the bishop who gave communion to Nelson Mandela was violating the law. Exactly. But, really. Clearly violating the law. <clears throat> but was it evil for him to do so? Was it simply a matter of violating a law? Or was it actually immoral for him to do that? Well, a scandal, and apart from the law. A scandal, yes. the uh, grievous thing, can induce others into, into heresy. Or, I mean, in that case, obviously... Well, I'd say it was, heresy. but in the, in the case, since this, this bishop who gave Nelson Mandela the Blessed Sacrament was not acting in conformity with canon law, it's not really no, very pertinent to our... Yes, the question we're considering is, the, 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 does the code of canon law itself uh, prove that John Paul II can't be a true pope because no true pope could, could promulgate such a law. I don't think we've seen any solid evidence at all that, that this um, disqualifies him from being a true pope. Further on that question, um, was anything done to this bishop to censure him for having given Nelson Mandela the Blessed Sacrament? I have no idea. Maybe he got wrapped over the knuckles by the pope. Well, I hope so, but I don't know. But even if he didn't, that would demonstrate the point. Would it like that? What it would demonstrate is uh, who really understands how that law is meant to be applied and when the authority makes a law and then enforces it in a certain way that is one of the ways in which you interpret what the law actually means and how it is to be understood and if the laws are made by the Vatican now and uh, everything runs amok uh, that the only people who are censured publicly are those who are trying to hold to the old faith and withstand the disintegration of the faith. When they're the only ones who are censured, this is an indication of what, is, what these laws really mean and the thinking of the lawgiver. And in this case, it is something very, very foul. I don't know if that logic applies well. I, I think that there could be a great number of people under a cloud of ignorance in the church like that bishop and so many more who are deliberately misreading the law, mm -hmm. contrary to the mind of the legislator. Contrary to the mind of the legislator. The one thing is uh, the weakness of uh, the uh, executive and uh, the intention of the legislator. Mm -hmm. The legislator intended something, then when he's called upon to enforce the law, he runs away. I mean, 
So that uh, uh, the one uh, concerns his activity as veterinary, the other as a chief executive of the church. I don't know what you want to <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, there is a sin here, the sin yeah. of omission or whatever, but it's, uh, but it's not uh, nothing to do with uh, the actual formal act of legislating. Well, Count, uh, what if the legislator rewards those who break the law? What? What if the legislator rewards those who break I mean the law. to say that there be, be a norm of canon law who says uh, um, those who violate the law will be rewarded by promotion. No, I'm not but saying the law, but in practice. That the legislature the will, for instance, in finding priests who are in clearly defying the, the law of the church, and when these priests are made bishops, in other words, this is what I think what Father James is saying, obviously there are bishops being elevated and priests being elevated mm -hmm. who defy the law uh, it seems to be rewarded by the Holy Spirit, not yes, by, I, by the legislative I, act, but simply by 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 the, by, by the fact. Uh, in in general, in states, the legislator is different from the executive. In the church, he's the same person. Obviously, the same person is in contradiction to himself. Obviously, the same person is committing a sin of omission. Obviously, the same person hasn't got the courage to probably uh, probably. Uh, um, what is it? Um, gives in to pressure, gives in to uh, to illicit pressure. All this is in the realm of uh, sin. It has nothing to do with the office. But but what many, many times, what the history of the courage to censure those well, who I mean, stand up for the faith? He has to answer for his lack of courage. The good Lord will ask him, "You emanated that law, and then you didn't apply." Well, no, what I'm well, saying, not only you, 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 you promoted those who, who those who who defied it. I'm, I'm saying is that's what human, if, nature. What if that's human find, nature. That's human nature. What if he finds the courage, though, to censure those who stand up for the faith and try because to resist those, the abuse? Because those, are, not those who are guilty of those it. Are not well, let's let's be fair here, because he's, it's not true that he's only censuring those who uh, are on the traditional side. Uh, just a few months ago, he yes. fired a French bishop who was speaking out blatantly against the church's teaching on a number of things. There have been censures, in my mind, not severe enough, but at least censures against people like Hans Kung and Charles Curran and uh, a couple of Spanish priests. So uh, the, the Pope is censuring, to some extent, perhaps not as strongly as he might, a number of those who are coming out with modernist and anti-traditional ideas as well. So I think we have to be have a balance. Well, it's I'd like to, uh, a point to stand on. I would say that in the practical order, the mind of John Paul II is manifested in his appointments as well as in his words and legislation. <clears throat> and he appointed somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, 190 of the 280 or so bishops in America. The Catholic Church in America is being devastated. The faith of the Catholic people is being destroyed in Catholic institutions by priests and by teachers. The morals of the children are being destroyed, and they're being destroyed by people who have their office in virtue of the fact that they were appointed by John Paul II. That's one point, but I would like to get back to the other point of the Eucharist. I, I think you're saying, you know, I'm not really sure, but I think you're saying that you do not believe that the teaching of the Catholic Church regarding the fact that the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of unity is not part of the faith. It is not divinely revealed or even taught by the universal ordinary mention. No, I'm not saying that at all. Certainly, the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of unity. I mean, that's St. Paul's teaching in the scriptures about the, the, as we're all one bread and one body and so on, okay. in 1 Corinthians. But uh, the question you give it to no, someone no, else? Because the, the question is, the crucial question is, does this fact of the Blessed Eucharist being the sacrament of unity admit of rare exceptions or not. Now, uh, the Holy See has judged now that it, does, uh, that it doesn't destroy the, the Eucharist as being the sacrament of unity if rare exceptions are, are, are permitted for giving Holy Union to non-Catholics uh, under the strict conditions laid down in canon law, which unfortunately are not being all, always strictly followed. They're not quite just, uh, okay. But um, uh, I'm not at all denying Certainly that the, the Blessed Eucharist is the sacrament of the Church's unity. In fact, when you look at the explanations given for this change in law, they say what Count Capone mentioned a while ago, that there are two things to be kept in mind, that the sacrament, Blessed Sacrament, is the sacrament of the Church's unity. 
And this rules out absolutely any unrestricted intercommunion between the Catholic Church and members of other churches. Uh, and they say the other thing to be kept in mind is that it is also a source of grace and the um, Salus Animarum Suprema Lex, that the, the idea that the salvation of souls is the, uh, the supreme law, that in, therefore that in certain cases, if we presume that a certain non-Catholic is a material, schismatic or heretic only, believes in the um, Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist, is in danger of death or in perhaps in some circumstance where there's no hope of, you know, for that person receiving the Blessed Sacrament, if he's or she is in good faith, could be a true means of grace. Therefore, the Church, as a merciful mother, wants to allow for certain exceptional circumstances where such a person would have access to this means of grace. Now, as I say, this, uh, this is a prudential judgment that the Church has taken now, that um, weighing the pros and cons, the Church now decides that, well, we can make some of these exceptions. But this is not at all denying uh, the principle which you mentioned, Bishop, that Yes, the, the Blessed Sacrament is and always must be the sign and cause and, 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 and focus and center of the Church's sacramental unity as the body of Christ. Right. You see, I completely disagree with that, and I think that that is contrary to what has always been held. I think that the teaching, for example, in St. Thomas or in uh, St. Alphonsus, especially in St. Thomas, for example, where he says very specifically that there are two... Uh, realities in the Holy Eucharist. And one reality is the body of Christ, Christ himself, and the other reality is the mystical body. And the one is, is signified and contained, the other is signified. So when you receive Holy Communion, you have to be in a state of sanctifying grace and have the faith. If you don't, you sin against the Blessed Sacrament. You sin against one reality. If, on the other hand, you are not a member of the mystical body of Christ and you receive Holy Communion, you, in that sense, uh, lie against the sacrament. St. Thomas says, if you receive Holy Communion in mortal sin, you will lie against the sacrament. If you give Holy Communion to someone who is not a member of the mystical body, you violate the other great reality that's contained in the Holy Eucharist. And this is what has always been taught by the Church but for 2,000 years. But it hasn't been proposed by the Church as necessarily divine and Catholic faith. That's it the, certainly is divinely it, revealed that it is a sacrament of unity. Yes, but... And it is certainly that's been another universally question. held by the Catholic Church for 2,000 years that you have to be a member of the Church to receive. Isn't that the universal, ordinary magisterium? It has not been universally held and taught by the Church for 2,000 years that this point is a matter of divine and Catholic faith. St. Thomas said... You know, this is St. Thomas writing as a theologian in going by the discipline of the church in his era, you can never give Holy Communion to a non-Catholic. That's still a long way from saying that the church as such, the universal church, is taught that it is divine and Catholic faith, that it's revealed truth that you can never make an exception to. The from church that. has always held that. It's been the universal uh, assent of the church, the universal it, ordinary majesty. But not necessarily as divine and Catholic faith. Not, not necessarily as revealed truth. No, it, 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 that's the very point. Where, you where, is, where, is your, where is your documentary proof to show that the church had previously taught as revealed truth, as revealed truth, that no exception can ever be made in giving communion to a non-Catholic? That's the point. Is there any doctrine or any statement that says you cannot perform an abortion that is that is divine in Catholic faith. The, the universal teaching of the church over 2,000 years has been that abortion is certainly a grave crime. Whether it's revealed truth or merely a matter of natural law is a matter of dispute. So the church could, has never decided on this. Could they come along and say we're going to make an exception in the case of danger to the mother's life. That we know that it's wrong, but we're making this exception the way we make the exception with the Holy Eucharist. No, because whether revealed or not, the teaching against abortion is infallibly proposed. Whether as revealed truth or wh whether one of the secondary truths that is connected with the deposit of faith, either way, it's infallibly taught. Who, who defined that? <laughs> that abortion is murder. What well, if all the all the popes who ever spoken on the subject have always said that abortion. The document. The 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 what is yes. it? Not very not the the last one. What's it called? Well, well the, the the previous Evangelium one, Evangelium. Evangelium. Vitae number fourteen, uh, absolutely rules out abortion. 
It's not an infallible mistake. Well, I maintain that it is, even that it's not, it's, not, it's not a dogmatic revealed truth, but I've recently published a 55-page article arguing that Humane VT14 is in fact an ex cathedra definition against sterilization, contraception and abortion. But now we're getting on to another matter. Right. The point is that um, whether abortion, the, the absolute prohibition of abortion, is a matter of revealed truth or not, it has certainly been, or, or, or natural law, it has certainly been uh, taught unanimously by all the popes who were taught and, and, and the bishops in union with him. You know, it was Lumen Gentium 25 says in Vatican II, uh, when a moral unanimity of all the bishops throughout the world um, have proposed in union with the Roman Pontiff that such and such a doctrine is to be definitively held, well, that's infallible. You know, now, ordinary magisterium. Yes, of course. But we have to distinguish between what's infallible and what is revealed truth, because things can be infallibly proposed without being revealed. Right. In order to be a heretic, you have to deny something which is proposed as revealed truth. And what I'm saying is that the church didn't propose for 2,000 years as a matter of revealed truth that you could never make an exception in giving Holy Communion to a non-Catholic. But she did teach that the Holy Eucharist was the sacrament of unity. Absolutely, and I agree with that. The Holy that. Eucharist contained the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that only Catholics could receive it. She didn't say that the doctrine of only Catholics can receive it is a matter of revealed truth. But she did say only Catholics could receive the Holy Eucharist. That was the tradition for 2,000 years. That was the discipline for 2,000 years. Well, you see, well, that's good enough for us. That's the point. In other words, well, it's you not can good start... enough for, for, for the doctrine of the Church. To say that a pope is, is violating some previous discipline or changing the previous discipline, that doesn't make him a heretic. It doesn't it's make him a heretic. A doesn't make, hmm? It's contrary to a doctrine. Well, that's the very point. I don't admit that the there, there is a ever... sacrament of unity. Yes, of course I admit that. We're going around in circles here. Yeah. Let, let's have some... I think what Bishop Kelly is saying is that this is a practice that is based upon a, do uh, a doctrine of the Church, which is... Of divine and Catholic faith. Any questions from the audience on this subject before we move on to another question? Any questions from the audience at all? Okay. Well, just, just one question. Yes. In regards to uh, the reception of Holy Communion to non Catholics. Could you just begin again with the microphone? Yeah. In regards to the uh, topic we're talking about, the reception of Holy Communion to non Catholics. Yes. Do these non Catholics have total confession? You are directing that question to uh, anyone who won't begin for the Harrison? Well, the, one of the conditions is they have to be properly disposed. If, if it's a person who belongs, say, to the Eastern Orthodox Church, they believe in confession. This Normally, well, it really, in fact, the only people who could be allowed uh, to Holy Communion under, under the, the dispositions of uh, the present canon law, I think, would be those who belong to churches that believe in confession like the Eastern Orthodox do. Now, um, if the Eastern Orthodox Christian asking uh, Catholic priests to receive Holy Communion, they, they believe in, in confession. Now, just as a Catholic asking for Holy Communion, the priest doesn't have to ask him whether he's, uh, you know, he's been to confession. He's presumed to, to judge for himself whether he's, he needs to go to confession or not. I mean, you don't have to ask every person who presents themselves for Holy Communion if they've been to confession or not. The same thing would apply in this case. If that person says, Father, I'm a Greek Orthodox Christian, I want to go to communion, I want to go to confession to you first, please, then he's allowed to hear that person's confession. If the person doesn't ask to go to confession, then the Catholic priest would have to presume, well, this person judges himself to be in the state of grace and does not need to go to confession and would therefore, according to this legislation, be able to give it to that person without uh, confession first. Okay, and that would also include uh, Buddhism? No. No, no, no. Because they don't believe in transubstantiation. The canon law admits giving communion only to those who believe in the full Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. And baptized, baptized Christians. Baptized Christians who believe in the full. Uh, and, and the. How can that possibly be uh, regulated? Does well, he have to make a declaration to the priest? That he will be receiving Holy Communion, that he's a non Catholic, uh, that he has no mortal sins on his soul, or that if he does, he's willing to go to confession, practice a different religion than what he is. The, the, the North seems like uh, completely unassaulted. Yeah. 
Also, it does provide for other than the Orthodox to receive communion. Right. Well, other Christians, for yeah, example, yeah. Lutheran. Well, 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 now Lutherans don't believe in, in the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. They believe in consubstantiation, which because is not the same as them. If you said to him, do you believe what the Catholic Church believes about the Eucharist? And this particular Lutheran said yes. Well, would, no, strictly speaking, you'd have to ask him now just what exactly is your belief about the Eucharist? What does the canon say there? Can you read us out what it says? Sure. It says, uh, first it deals with the question of orthodox. Okay. And then it says, to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church, who cannot approach a minister of their own community, okay. and who spontaneously ask for them, provided that they demonstrate the Catholic faith in respect to these sacraments and are properly disposed. Okay, so they have to demonstrate the Catholic faith. If I was uh, approached by someone in that situation, I'm an Anglican father. Um, I'd like to receive Holy Communion. I would be obliged by that canon to ask, first of all, now, do you hold the same faith as the Catholic Church in regard to this sacrament? He says yes. Yes, but well, I would, I would question him first. Now, what do, you, what do you understand by the Eucharist? You might think you have the Catholic... He says he believes in the real presence and that's transubstantiation. Not enough. That's not, that's not, well, real presence is not enough. And transubstantiation. Luther, Luther, uh, if he says to you, you believe that the, the, the bread and wine truly, really, substantially change in the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, okay, that's... He says yes. He says yes, then he's demonstrated Catholic... But I don't believe in the Pope, or a devotion to the Blessed Mother, or the Immaculate Conception, or I believe in artificial contraception, I think homosexuality is okay, and I really, truly, in my heart of hearts, believe these things. Yeah, but you might find plenty of, plenty of unorthodox Catholics who deny a lot of those... I know, but can you give them Holy Communion? Nowadays. The thing is that you don't have to according ask to the them law. things. You, according to the law, even for Catholic, you, every Catholic who comes to ask the Holy, you don't have to go through the whole list of all the doctrines to see if he's Orthodox and every single thing, this, 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 or this. You'd never be able to give right. communion all day. I mean, you give it to them. You, you, pre, you presume right. it. You presume it that, uh, that they ha, that they are, are are adequately prepared for Holy Communion, and you give it to them. That's in the Catholic Church. But if they're what? Anglican. Yes, but if they if they're Anglicans, you, 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 you don't have to question them. Certainly, according to this code and all those other things, the the church has made this prudential judgment that if it, it's sufficient to give them holy communion if they believe in the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist right. and they have no access to their own ministers and so on. That's very rarely going to happen anyway. And as I say, I don't I I don't want to defend this as the best possible legislation. All I have to do is to show that or maintain or demonstrate that it's not a serious enough, um, uh, it's, not, it's not a law which is seriously harmful enough to classify the legislator as a heretic and therefore as no true pope. And that, that's the essential thing where... Yeah, we're but that is not what I said though. What I said was that it contains something which is unholy, something which is contrary to Catholic belief and Catholic morals, something which is a sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament, and something which destroys the unity of the church. But I grant you, Father, you know that you do believe that, but to my way of thinking, of having been raised in the Catholic faith, having grown up in the time when the changes were introduced into the, into the church, and having had to, to fight, and you, I think, have had similar experiences in the seminary, you know, with uh, professors who didn't have the Catholic faith. See, I know, according to my Catholic faith, that I could not give the Holy Eucharist to someone was formerly a member of a heretical sect or a schismatic sect. And I believe that this is the faith of our fathers, and I also believe that this is one of those cases about which St. Paul said in his epistle to the Galatians, he says, if we, meaning himself the apostle, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel different from the gospel you have received and have heard from us, let it be anathema. I cannot reconcile this yeah, well, I mean, the, the gospel there means revealed truth, doesn't it? And that's what I'm saying. I don't believe... The sacrament of unity. I don't... Well, I accept that as revealed truth, certainly, but I don't, I don't... I don't see it that the church traditionally proposed as revealed truth that uh, this character of the Eucharist of the sacrament of unity can under no circumstances admit of any uh, possible exception. Okay, not to labor the point. Let me just... The final thing I would simply say is that it is the sacrament of unity, and what the church has always taught is you have to be an actual member of the Catholic Church to receive communion. And because of that, I cannot see any conceivable way to reconcile it with Catholic religion. Yeah, well, well I, I don't see it that as having been taught as divine and Catholic faith. That's the difference.
I think, for example, if you went to, into the Diocese of Rockville Center, what you would find is the vast majority of people do not have the faith, but that you would find people there who do have the faith. Right, so the there overwhelming are. majority would not be Catholic in the sense that they would not have the faith, and that would also be true with regard to a very high percentage of the clergy. Right, then, then you then, would find uh, Catholics here and there, if that's your question, but if they do have the true faith, then they're part of the Catholic Church even though we're living in an age of confusion. Because those Catholic people, for example, that you're talking about, will go to confession to a priest, and as a general principle and a general rule, they will tell the people that it's okay to use artificial contraception, or they will sanction divorce and remarriage. So you have a, a serious problem and great confusion where you have Catholic people going to <clears throat> churches in which there are other Catholic people, but also in which there are those who do not have the faith including the clergy. However, my question specifically was, is it your position that there is no diocesan church, properly so-called, where the, where the true visible Catholic faith can still be found? Well, I haven't examined all of the dioceses, but uh, if I do, you know, I'll give you a report on each one. So, then you'd, so my question is whether you can answer that yes or no. My question is that I have not seen evidence of the Catholic faith being proclaimed by the bishops in the United States. What I see, rather, is the universal destruction and corruption of faith and morals. Uh, and that this is true of Catholic universities, Catholic colleges, Catholic seminaries, and Catholic parishes. But if you can enlighten me that there is a diocese where the Catholic faith is upheld and where heresy is not tolerated, I'd be interested well, to find out. But, but the question is, is the burden on me to establish the existence of the visible church? Or, or, or is it upon you to <laughs> tell us whether the visible church still exists in dioceses, since apparently you, you deny it. I answered your question. All right. And then, and then lastly, regarding Paul VI, I, I wasn't clear. Do you say that during his pontificate he ceased to be the Pope? I personally believe that. And, and with respect to, to John the Twenty Third, are you morally certain that he at least was the Pope? Oh, yeah. Okay. And so you're saying that between John the Twenty Third and today, we've had two vacant seats, that of Paul VI and that of the... Uh, current pontiff, who you say is of dubious validity. I didn't say anything about John Paul I. Said about well, do you have an opinion on, on John Paul I? I don't. Okay. So then we've had two vacancies in the Holy See in the past 30 years. In my opinion? Yes. Yes. Okay. But the great difference between what Bishop Kelly is sustaining here and the, the theoretical possibility that some of the saints like St. Robert Bellarmine Ray, is that in fact, the, the, the authority you just quoted there about the, the theoretical idea that the church could declare a particular pope in some hypothetical situation to be not the pope because of this. What those authors, I think, were envisaging is a situation where it becomes obvious to everybody, to, to the church as a whole, that some particular pontiff has lapsed into heresy and that the church, you know, the, the, the leaders, the college of cardinals, the whole of the bishops as a, as, as a group would be able to recognize this and, and do something about it, whether formally depose him or, or the idea that he's automatically deposed, but whatever, the presumption I think that these people had in mind would, would be that if this catastrophe did occur, the church as a whole would still be uh, able to discern this and, and therefore to be able to rectify the situation by choosing a new successor of Peter. But you're positing a situation in which not only the Pope has lapsed into heresy, but the whole College of Cardinals is incapable of discerning this in heresy, so pre presumably they hold the same heretical ideas, otherwise they would uh, do something about it and, and, and uh, elect a new Pope or whatever. And not only the College of Cardinals, but the, virtually the entire 2,000 odd bishops around the world. You're suggesting a situation in which not only the Pope as an individual has lapsed into heresy, but where virtually the whole leadership of the Church has lapsed into heresy. This is what I find very hard to... to to, or impossible to reconcile with Christ's promises of indefectibility to the church. You're suggesting a situation that goes far beyond what Bellarmine and perhaps uh, some of the others have raised as a possibility. Well, I'm suggesting that a great apostasy has taken place, whether it is the great apostasy spoken of by St. Paul. The second epistle to the Thessalonians is another question. A great apostasy has taken place. But really, it's not so complicated or difficult as it may seem, Father, because, for example, at the time of the Great Western Schism, you had three dubious popes at one time. 
Well, I'm suggesting because one, one, one of those was, was the valid pope, though. That's a different situation from what but you're the people didn't know it. postulating. The people didn't know it. Well, the people did know that there, were, there was someone there who was not the true pope because it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't that the people at that time thought that the papal see was vacant, which is what you're saying. They, 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 they were divided as to who was the true pope, but they all believed that there was a true pope. They were not sede vacantes. So there were three dubious popes. What I'm saying objectively is that there is one dubious pope today who I personally do not believe is the vast majority did not believe that the pope in which they believed was dubious. Was dubious. No, they, they, they had was dubious, objectively speaking. speaking. No, but they did to the fact. Yes. No, no well, object objectively speaking, the true pope uh, was not dubious at all. There was one. Uh, there was one true pope who objectively was the pope, and later it became clear to the church in. In well, general, St. Vincent Ferrer. To today, the Church does not consider those who followed the Avignon Pope or the Pisa Pope to have been schismatics. Because of the confusion reigning at the time, there were objective doubts concerning each one of the men who were claimants to the papal throne. Well, and the, the Church does, uh, does not regard even the, the so called Pope of Avignon and the Pope of Pisa as being anti popes or outside the Church because of the confusion that was reigning there. Well, I think that uh, I think I, did, that I think that they are considered anti -popes, anti popes because John the Twenty Third took the name of Twenty Third, although there was a Twenty Third, it was a piece of pope was John the Twenty Third, so he's obviously considered an anti pope. Right, no. but the Church today does not uh, say that the original John the Twenty Third of Avignon has the status of an anti pope. Formally, because of the confusion reigning at the time. I mean, you well, can say that materially he was. But. He's included on some list as a pope. In the official list in the Anuario Pontificio, which is as official as you can get, that's the, the Vatican's official publication, he's not listed as a pope, that's for sure. I mean, they've, they've got the, 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 the authentic line of popes during that, that schism, right. and the others are not there. Now, so he's not officially described... The old as Catholic anti encyclopedia... Numbers have well, the Pope. Yeah, but I mean, you could say that the Church as such, you, you could argue that the Church as such never says that anybody is an, an anti-Pope, because that, that's a quote, that it's, not a, it's not a magisterial statement that the Church says so-and-so is an anti-Pope, but those are the decisions made by authors of encyclopedias and theologians that's and Church story. historians. I mean, that's not a, in a sense, you could say it's, uh, whether we call them by that label or not, it's not a, it's not a position of the Church as such. The, the confusion of the times. Could excuse from that later. Subjectively, historical. subjective, you could excuse them from from actually committing the sin of schism. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that that's getting into completely different. That's a different issue whether they're in schism or not. I'm, I'm not. With regard I to, I think sorry. we ought. After one more question, we'll pause. May I make a short comment? I think the strongest case for the plausibility of what Bishop Kelly is saying is to point to the obvious degradation in the church the obvious collapse of faith and morals and everything else. And for the record, I'd simply like, like to note this. I think that's why we're all here, because we're so worried about the loss of faith and so on. For the record, I'd like to point out, I got my doctorate in philosophy in 1952 at a Catholic university, allegedly Catholic, allegedly Jesuit. In those days, it was a superb university. But every single error that is now promulgated from pulpit and Catholic publication I already heard by 1952, my great mentor was Dietrich von Hildren, he was alarmed at errors in philosophy, theology, biblical scholarship. So what did, so I propose this scenario that for a long time historical forces, forces were working in culture, in church institutions, in church publications, dangerous wrong errors in church and state institutions. This, this uh, was increasingly attacking the faith of the church with the Trinity Mass existing, nevertheless. Vatican II was an attempt to try to stop the hemorrhaging. It might have been a blunder to call it. It might have been that the fruits of Vatican II have in no way shown any sort of thing. It made the matter worse. It might have been we had weak popes, cowardly popes, confused popes. But the issue at question is, does this general chaos, justify Bishop Kelly in saying we have no hope. In expressing the opinion. Uh, Bob Perico? Yes, I have three, three more questions. Oh. Mr. Kelly, okay. Bob, Father, and Kelly. In that order, then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to say something. Maybe I could answer Dr. Mara's question. 
in a fashion anyway. Uh, in the real world, uh, we find ourselves in a situation whereas if we follow the new church, if I send my children down to St. Francis de Chantel, they will not be following the Catholic Church. They will grow up believing there is no such thing as sin, no such thing as hell. They won't practice the sacrament of penance. Uh, they'll be disrespectful. They won't know whether the uh, host is the real presence or if it's not. And so we ask ourselves, what are we to do? Because this is the official church of John Paul II. We also know that the Pope of the church cannot destroy the church. Yet we see the church virtually destroyed. So what do we say? We don't say doctrinally he is not the Pope. We don't have the confidence to say that. But certainly we have a doubt whether he is or not. And we can't allow our children to lose their souls if they practice a new religion that comes from John Paul. So we don't say doctrinally he's not the Pope, but we do have to take action. Now, certainly you must think the same thing because you say the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Walsh, they go to the traditional Latin Mass. For what reason? Can I speak to that, please? Um, I say the tradi traditional Latin Mass, too. I prefer it greatly to the, the new Mass, but I also, I don't agree that the new Mass is heretical or that it is um, sacrilegious or any of these accusations that have been made against it. Then you're a Catholic, though. You're saying that the new religion comes from John Paul II. I deny that categorically, insofar as uh, false doctrine is coming down to grassroots level. This is because people are disobeying what Pope John Paul II is teaching. The, uh, you might accuse him, if you like, of being not sufficiently active in disciplining uh, the bishops who are letting this kind of thing go on. But it's wrong to say that this is sort of flowing directly from John Paul II as the source. There was absolutely no shadow of a reason in what you're saying there that can call doubt, call in question or doubt his status as true Pope. As Pope, he is responsible. That he is not doing his job, then shouldn't we, instead of praising him, shouldn't we be getting petitions up uh, to ask him to resign his post? He is not the only person who is responsible, even with the best will in the world, the Pope has to, has to depend, when he's nominating bishops, for instance, he has to depend on the advice he gets from his nuncios. He can't possibly know the personal pros and cons, the personal history and qualifications of every single candidate for, for ordination. He can tell his nuncios, I want guys who uh, are solid in the faith, they're against contraception, they're against women priests, the different controversial things, but he still has to depend on the... Uh, the recommendations he gets. Okay, you say, well, he should appoint better nuncios if he finds he's getting weak bishops. Okay, he, he's got to depend on someone's recommendations for that too. Now, you can, it's all very easy to say, well, the buck stops with him. You know, he's the guy responsible. But what I'm saying is that the practical real order, there's a whole lot of things that happen in between the Supreme Pontiff and grassroots level. And uh, with the chaos that developed in the last 20 or 30 years, you know, it may not be, humanly speaking, possible for one pope to correct everything and correct all the abuses. You know, there's. I'm, I'm not saying that he's he's governing the church in the best possible way. I, I I agree that I think he should be. There should be more. Like he fired this French bishop a few months ago. I think he should be firing more bishops. All I'm saying is that you can't say all of the responsibility rests with him and put all the blame on the pope. You know, uh, he, his. His teaching about faith and morals is sound. And when people don't obey that, you know, th this is a, a disastrous situation, but you can't put all of the blame for that on the Pope. As regards, you're talking about your children. If they go to the local parish church, they lose the faith. Okay, well, there's other alternatives. There's, there's, there's homeschooling. A lot of people are doing that and, and, and giving their own children the faith in their, in their own home. But... Um, in their art traditional chapel, or the indulged chapel, they all... Well, that's supposed to be the Catholic Church. That's his local Catholic church that is run by the bishop who is John Paul's bishop. Sure, but doesn't mean to say that John Paul's not the Pope. But there are some... No, but is there an emergency in the church? Sure, there's an emergency. Sure, there is. 
But I well, think I that in sincere Catholics can find even number two other parishes where they can find the faith being preached. Father Ashley? Don't you think, though, too, that given that what is alleged to have happened with Pope John Paul II to make him not be the Pope has never happened before, that somehow or other the words of St. Robert Bellarmine then are true? That in practice also God hasn't allowed that to happen and would not allow it to happen? Well, if you want to believe that he is uh, the vicar of Christ on earth, and I would say that the overwhelming majority of people who attend our masses certainly believe he is the Pope. You, we're, not, we're not creating a problem with that. We're, we're not standing up and preaching as a dogma that he's not the Pope. You ask us our opinion. I gave my opinion. It's not something that we preach from the pulpit, but it's, it's, a, it's an opinion based upon an attempt uh, to analyze and to find some theoretical explanation for the situation that's taken place in the church. Okay. But, but, but the simple, I think the question, and I think it's a very important question that people have to face, because sometimes we do get too much on the uh, level of theory, the simple fact is that if you go to the parishes, for example, on Long Island where Pat Kelly lives, you send your children to those schools, they're trained by the sisters they have or by the priests they have, your children will not come out Catholic. Whether the rainy that? whether the rainy pope is responsible for that, that's another that's question. Father Pericone. Now I have a, uh, yeah, a, a, a lot of a, a lot of Father, I want to just complete. And, you know, in relation to that same question, though, then if you allege, see, that the present pope is not the pope because of this canon regarding communion to non-Catholics, baptized non-Catholics. Would you say that Pius XII was not the reigning pope? Because as Father Harrison pointed out earlier, he gave permission through the Holy Office for non-Catholics to receive communion. So would you say he's also not the successor of St. Peter? No, I would not. And I would not for two reasons. First of all, I don't believe Pius XII did it. But even if he did do it, he would have been guilty of a grave sin against the Blessed Sacrament. And being guilty of a grave sin against the Blessed Sacrament would not call into question his position at the Roman Pontiff. Yeah, but However, what? one second. However, that's a different case yeah. than the promulgation of universal law for the whole church. That is protected by the very nature of the Catholic Church is holy. In other words, a, a, a vicar of Christ, the Roman Pontiff, cannot promulgate laws for the universal church that are unholy or that are destructive of souls or that promo, uh, promote heresy and so forth. So in other words, it's an essentially different case, yeah, I, even if Pius XII did that. So the answer is... That is a law of the Universal Church. Yes, it's a decision right. of the Holy Office. It, it, it's, it's completely it's different case. case. It's no, it is a law. It's not a law. Well, you're not a law. That derogated from the 1970... If he did say that, it derogated from the 1970 code and became the Universal Church. I did not count Capone, though, mention that earlier, though, too, that it is then a universal law by the fact that the Pope promulgated even through the Holy Office. But by the Pope cannot do that. A pope cannot change the essential nature of the Holy Eucharist. He cannot tell yeah. you that you can do things which are evil and sinful. Yeah, but then if that's the case, then you're saying that Pius is a well, mortal sin. Yeah, but then wouldn't you have to conclude that he wasn't the legitimate successor of St. Peter well, because he's also in a state of heresy? Pius the Twelfth, I'm talking about. No, Pius the Twelfth did not make it a universal law. But the Count of Pony is saying he did make it a universal yeah. law by, by granting an exception. When uh, the when there was a question in uh, uh, the evaluation of uh, potency in marriage, the, there was a there was an opposition between the rota and the holy office. The rota asked for the verum semen within the Carnival Act, and the holy office decided uh, had for three hundred years said no, that is not necessary. Pope Paul VI. Uh, uh, concluded in favor of the Holy Office. That became the law of the Universal Church. Ed, Ed, did you have a question? Discussion about College of Cardinals, and I'm just wondering, are popes and College of Cardinals in unison or individually indefectible in any way? That's my first question. Could, could you repeat first, it again? Okay. We'll stop the count. Okay, my question is, are popes and Colleges of Cardinals in unison or individually, indefectible? Popes or colleges of cardinal in unison, indefectible. Or in individually? Or individually. Yeah. 
we come to the, uh, the College of Cardinals, uh, it doesn't come into the question, of course the College of Cardinal is not indefectible, it, it can make a lot, uh, as a college, as if they meet together, they, they, they can say, they, they can, they can, uh, I mean, they, they can, uh, they can defect from the faith also, uh, as a college. Now, the question of the indefectibility of the Pope, which comes to the question, uh, reverts the question of can a Pope be a heretic or not, which we've been discussing. I, uh, following St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, the, the question is purely theoretical because in practice God will never allow it. Yes. That's, I should say, the standard Well, answer. that actually touches on my second question uh, for clarification. Uh, by the way, the College of Cardinals is not, a, is not a, uh, an institution. Right, system. they're defectible. It's a human law. So they could be in unison with the uh, Pope and be defectible in unison. That's basically my well, point. My point earlier was that Christ's promise of the Peter to me exclude the possibility that the whole hierarchy will fall into heresy. Now, he said, on this rock I will build my church. That rock didn't refer to only to Peter as an individual. It meant a rock by its very nature is an enduring, subsisting, permanent, solid foundation. Okay, that's the whole point of the image. It doesn't mean this Pope or that Pope. It means the whole continuing uh, succession of Popes, the papacy as such. Now the point is, if we've got a situation where a Pope lapses into heresy, and in fact nobody in positions of responsibility like cardinals and bishops Nobody recognizes this. They're all into heresy as well, so they fail to elect immediately another true pope to, to replace this hypothetically heretical pope. Then you have got a situation where it seems to me Christ's promises to Peter would have failed because that in, in, the, the papacy, decade, a, decade after decade, with simply no pope there and, and, and none of the cardinals and bishops recognizing this, what has happened to Christ's promise that the papacy as such will remain up till the end? And this is the big problem I have right, with this. Right, the papacy problem. will remain till, till the end because it's That's a the rock of instituted Peter. office. But it can be vacant for a certain amount of time. But back to the other question and a point that you raised uh, when Christ said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. When did uh, Peter actually take office and become the vicar of Christ. I mean, what I'm trying to say is, did, did you have a situation, Christ on earth, and a pope, when you actually had the true shepherd of the mystical body of Christ, and a pope, could that be one in the same? I, I would say that the precise moment when Peter received jurisdiction as the first pope would have been the day of Pentecost. This was, this was the, the public promise. We say the church was born on Calvary, with the, you know, the, the blood and water that flowed from our right. Lord's side. Um, because if you like, said it conceived on Calvary, brought to light publicly and proclaimed the, pro the public pro proclamation of the gospel with the obligation of all men to receive baptism and come to the church, yeah. that began on the day of Pentecost. I would say that would be the day in which Peter began to exercise his, his power of jurisdiction from then on. Okay. Which is so, so clearly it acts when he speaks as such. Okay, that, that was good for clarity. And uh, just going back to the other point, so you agree that colleges of cardinals and bishops, individually and in unison in, in certain decisions, or what have you, are defectable. That's oh, in, in, in certain decisions, yes. Clear the, but I, clear the next, because if we speak of cardinals, we better speak of the world episcopate, which is divinely appointed, yeah. yes. The, cardinals are the, 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 the universal episcopate could not fall into heresy together with the Pope and just remain in that situation for, for decade after decade. This, this would mean that the... Uh, the hierarchy is failed. Be, because, that, because then the papacy, the papacy, by not being filled by the remaining bishops, would have lapsed. That's why I'm saying it. individual bishops can fail. Okay. Oh, so we can't have a lapse in between uh, ruling... Well, every time a Pope be, be dies, vacant, of course, there's a, there's a vacant between. period, yes. But what I'm saying, I, I cannot see how it could be reconciled with Christ's promises to Peter that number one, a pope lapses into heresy, and that number two, 
that lapse is not remedied by the election of a new and valid pope because the rest of the church recognized this and immediately um, as the quotation that Bishop Crowley read, uh, that, that maybe the church, the rest could be, depose a heretical pope. But the thing is they would have to, uh, if Christ, Christ's promises are to be fulfilled, this hypothetical lapse into heresy on the part of a pope would have to be quickly fulfilled by the rest of the bishops so that the papacy as such uh, continues uh, and we do have the unity of the church preserved. Right, the mystical body. Yeah. But is the pope the church? When Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church, yeah. Peter, you are the rock. Yeah. Are they one and the same? Or, in fact, is Peter defectible? Along with today, you know, the modern church, the contemporary church, not necessarily liberal, but defectable with his colleges. I mean by defectable, Peter, Peter as an, in, as he, an, as he an into heresy. was capable I know of, we went over this. Of, of sin, he denied Christ, and even later after he was publicly the head of the universal church, he, okay. he, he was One more. defected in a certain moment and had to be corrected by, by St. Paul, but he didn't cease to be the prince of the apostles. Okay, and this is my second question for clarity. Uh, when St. Bellamine makes his distinctions, when he says that a pope can cease to be pope, that's grounded in Catholic truth. We all agree upon that. Then he makes a second distinction. Well, just well let me just finish my right. point. That's a speculation. It's not grounded on if, Catholic truth. I, I'm not conceding that. Well, if St. Bellamine never was, had he never been born, we could know the defectibility of a pope and the infallibility of a pope. The theologians virtually universally taught that a pope could become a heretic and would cease to be pope. Okay, and that, that brings me to my... Make it Catholic truth. That was a Well, I'm just saying. Okay, okay. That, that brings me to the distinction. To believe that. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. The distinction is that he clearly makes in the second paragraph, I believe, is that we cannot dis dis depose or judge a true pope who is the Holy Father, who seems to want to destroy the church, but has not defected in the faith. Then on this last point that has been brought up about uh, Bellamine's, and I believe another saint's opinion, Alphonse's uh, opinion, that is clearly a theological opinion when he says, we can rightly presume that this will never happen, that a pope, even uh, personally, will fall into heresy. So it's, it's clear that it's an opinion, I believe. If I make no myself question, clear. Right. Okay, thank you. I would like to add one thing, and that is, well, I, I understand what uh, Father is saying, and I understand the anxiety that Catholic people feel over this question, and how people may get the impression that if you talk this way, that somehow you're really going after the papacy, which is which is not the case with us. You know? Rather, it is contrary. We absolutely, and without qualification, affirm the teaching of the Catholic Church with regard to the papacy. But I do believe that it is uh, the teaching of sacred scripture and the teaching of the fathers of the church, that there would come a time, according to what St. Paul said in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, that the restrainer, whoever that restrainer is, that is given to the church, this extraordinary restrainer, given to the church to protect the church, will be withdrawn. St. Paul says that. And when the restrainer is withdrawn from the scene, then the mystery of iniquity will have free reign, and that will bring about what is generally referred to as the great apostasy or the great revolt. So when that does happen, and it must happen, whether it's happening today or not is another question. I personally believe it is. But when that does happen, there will occur a virtual universal apostasy from the Catholic faith. So in other words, not only is it possible for there to be a virtual universal apostasy, it must happen. There's a time when it will happen. But not, my friend. Are we not? Well, the heresy. Just to, to reply to that, a, a universal apostasy, or, or near universal, or very widespread apostasy, certainly that seems to be predicted as part of the end times. That's a very different question from saying this is going to come about because the person who everybody, or nearly everybody in the world, understands to be the Pope is in fact the Antichrist, and he is the one who's leading them. It doesn't follow at all that that's the way the apostasy is going to come. My personal understanding would be that the Antichrist uh, would most likely to be, let, let's say we were, someone was talking yesterday about, you know, Hitler, if Hitler had won the war, he's out to destroy the church. 
You can quite imagine Cardinal the Cardinal. Cardinal Stickler. <laughs> you can quite Im imagine some hypothetical future scenario in which a, a vehemently anti-Christian dictator manages to, uh, let's say, invade St. Peter's and place himself in scorn. You know, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, it talks about the, the man of sin sitting in the place of God, and we, we can imagine readily some some brutal dictator persecuting the church and placing himself in the in the very throne of, the, of Peter, let's say, out of scorn and hate. But he, but but faithful Catholics will recognise this is not the successor of Peter. This is an enemy of the church. It's a very different thing to say that when the great apostasy comes. It's going to be an apparent pope who's going to lead everybody. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. What I said was that there would be a virtual universal apostasy from the faith. And in fact, the sequence of events is that that apostasy must come first. And then in the wake of the apostasy will come uh, the rise of the Antichrist. I'm not implying that there will not be a great and holy pope at some time in the near future. I'm just saying that it is not impossible in the time of the great apostasy to have a period where you do not have a valid pope for 10, 20, or 30 years, and that it's not contrary to Catholic teaching to suggest that such a thing might happen. It, it is also possible that there are bishops, <coughs> members of the hierarchy in the world, who do not approve of such canons as we're speaking of, giving Holy Communion to not yeah. I also would like to state that uh, the situation in the church is varies very much from country to country. Obviously, in the West, Secularism has taken hold of society, but that's not 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 necessarily the fault of the church. Where Italy now nowadays is no longer a Catholic country, it's not only the fault of the church; it's the fault of of, of secularism as we understand it. And uh, certainly, the situation of the church in Italy isn't as bad as the situation, say, in North America. I suppose the situation of the church in the Philippines is Puerto much Rico. better, and Puerto Rico much better than the situation uh, in Italy. I don't know. The bad uh, the situation in Poland. I have happen to have a Polish son-in-law, so I don't uh, hear something about it. Is certainly not the situation of the church in the in the, in the United States. So I mean, one can't sort of say uh, that there is a general disaster in the same way everywhere. No. Father Ashley, no, I can. Help, I think that we're still uh, sort of skirting around the whole dog dogmatic definition of the First Vatican Council. I mean, when it said that there will be successors in this dogmatic definition in perpetuity in the Sea of Peter and the Diocese of Rome, doesn't that automatically, uh, you know, tell us that somehow or other you couldn't have such a long period of vacancy? That after that period, everybody has said, guess, well, maybe this is the real Pope, or this, but somehow or other, that's tied in with the indefectibility of the Pope, the Church, too, isn't it? I don't think it says that at all, or I don't think it means that. What? I don't think there's any implication that you can limit the time between Popes to three years, or four years, or five years, or ten years. I don't think that's what that means. Yeah, do you the think institution so? of the papacy obviously is an intrinsic part of the constitution of the Church, and the indefectibility of the Church guarantees that that institution will last to the end of time. But I don't think the First Vatican Council meant to say, or even accidentally did say, that you cannot have a time where you don't have a pope for 10, 20, or 30 years. How long That's that, reading into it. But how long could that last? Say it happened for 100 years. How well, do you recognize that this is all of a sudden is the valid pope who's a pope? You know, where, where are they coming from? Yeah, I, I agree that there has to be a continuity. In other words, that that it's, that it's something that cannot go on indefinitely. Yeah, but it seems to me, though... But I don't think you can limit it to 30 years. It seems to me, though, that it's built into the dogmatic definition of there will be success with C. of Peter in perpetuity, uh, that, that it, it couldn't have for that long period of time, somehow. Well, to me, it seems it could. Yeah, I just because then you'll be talking about the visibility of the Church being so, je so jeopardized. Yeah that an integral part of our constitution would not be visible to people so they could practice the Catholic faith. How do you live the Catholic faith integrally without a Roman punishment? Hmm. That's the point. It could be a punishment for sin. That's not a sufficient answer, though. I mean, well, well, actually it is. What did, what did people do in Japan when there was no Roman Catholic clergy there? For 200 years, they continued to practice the faith as well as they could. Yes, but so every time... Christ, that's another question, though. There was another... Uh, 
say, another pope elected to two or three years later. Catholics still lived the faith. They knew what the faith was. Yeah. And they continued and, to practice it. And they probably would believe that there were bishops of Rome who were the vicar of Christ, supreme head of the church, and they would embrace that as an act of Catholic no, faith. But they didn't live under the circumstances that we live under, where the bishops are in a systematic and uh, consistent way destroying the faith and morals of tens of millions of people, yeah. and that these bishops were appointed by John Paul II. Yeah. They didn't live under those circumstances. Yeah, so the which, though, of course, the proof lies on you because it's a general statement to say that all bishops are demoralizing and destroying the Catholic faith. Virtually. Clearly, when clearly that's not true at all. In this country, true. virtually, it's true. I have one other question. Uh, Pope Pius IX, in a rescript that was sent to the Apostolic Nuncetor in Syria at the end of the last century, gave permission for baptized non-Catholics to receive the sacrament of penance and the sacrament of extreme unction. Did he thereby cease to be the Roman Pontiff because he gave that permission, which would be contrary to the nature of a sacrament of penance and the sacrament of extreme unction? He, he did not because because the sacrament of penance and the sacrament of extreme unction are not the sacrament of unity. By the reception, for example, of the sacrament of extreme unction by a non-Catholic in good faith, it's a totally different situation because the Holy Eucharist is, by its very nature, the sacrament of unity. It is unity with our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why it requires faith and the state of grace, and it is unity with the mystical body of Christ. The very nature of the sacrament. Yeah, the now, if, the one sacrament. second, if you don't believe that the church is identical with the Catholic Church, that Christianity is identical with the Catholic Church, then you can have a justification. But according to Pius XII, for example, in Mystici Corporis, in order to be an actual member of the church, you must be baptized and you must profess the faith. To give the Holy Eucharist, which is the sacrament of unity, to those who reject the faith is a sin against the Holy Eucharist and a sin against the unity of the church. Yeah, but it's not totally the, different case, Father. No, I don't see that at all because it's not the sacrament of penance, as St. Thomas would say, also to an extent, a sacrament of unity because it restores the unity of an individual with the mystical body of Christ, too, who unfortunately by sin made, maybe the sin of heresy even has separated himself from it. He, he does not say that, the, he does not say it is sacrament of unity. He, does, he doesn't say it. But he's not the only theologian. No theologian says that. Uh, the in the whole world. The sacrament of penance deals with the internal form, the severing of an individual from Christ mm -hmm. by sin. The lifting of censures is a different matter altogether. One can go to the sacrament of penance and be forgiven of sin and still need censures such as heresy and schism lifted by another authority. But, you know, well, Father, that's not the exactly. argument, the whole question comes down to, I believe, as has been stated here somewhat before, that the situation of the church is so great as to demand an explanation of some kind to how this can be. And what we see is collusion and more than collusion on the part of John Paul II and Paul VI and so on now, as to why each of these men did participate in this destruction of the church or uh, lend a hand in doing so. Um, that we can argue all we want, you know, as far as their internal disposition. But the fact is that there is a great crisis and this could not happen without the collusion of whoever is in Rome. Somebody who has the pretense, at least the pretense, of the authority to make this happen. But when you get right down to it, you cannot deny that it is not contrary to the faith. What I mean to say is that it is not uncatholic, if you'll excuse all of the negatives, here, to hold that a pope can defect from the faith and lose his office thereby. And that's what we're saying. And the argument then further is to say, has John Paul II done so, or has Paul VI done so? Well, we can argue that point, but I think when we're all done, we have to say, well, it really is a matter of opinion, but we are entitled to hold that opinion. Two docs for church say that, practically speaking, even if theoretically impossible, practically speaking, God would see that it would not happen. But you're, you're, that is their opinion. Father Jenkins, you're saying more than that John Paul II has lapsed from the faith in the papacy. You're also saying that we're in a situation where nobody else can recognize this, and the whole of the rest of the, the episcopate, morally speaking, has, has gone with him. The, well, the, the, the Bellum and these other doctors of the church did, never said that they, but that kind of situation was in business. Well, I'll respond to that. It is not 
necessarily a fact that there are not other bishops in the world who recognize that the church is in a very grave state. In fact, I would venture to say that there are a lot of bishops, as Count Capone mentioned, perhaps in other countries, in what was uh, formerly uh, Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, the Eastern Bloc, who recognize that there is something gravely wrong in the church, who do not go along with a lot of the changes that have been made, and who find them offensive to the faith. And this is to say that it is not necessarily so that the entire hierarchy has defected. There are many bishops, I believe, in the Ukraine and other parts of the world who still hold the Catholic faith and reject these modernist practices that have come in after Vatican II. Yes, but they recognize John Paul II as Pope, and they're not, they're, therefore they're not doing anything to replace him. That's the point. But if, if you hold as a... Well, I'll give you an example. Okay? I don't know how firmly they hold that. Uh, as a, just as an example, in 1990, in late July, I was talking to Bishop Mendez by telephone. And uh, Bishop Mendez volunteered to me, and I know he's not here to answer for himself, but I, I will swear to the truth of this, he volunteered to me that he had doubts about the legitimacy of John Paul II. He didn't say he was convinced he wasn't the Pope, but he said he had doubts about him, and he said the reason he had doubts about him was because he didn't understand how it could be possible that an ecclesiastical an ecclesiastic could be promoted through the ranks of the Church in Poland with the approval of the communist uh, dictators of Poland and rise to become the primate of the church in Poland and uh, and still uh, not have compromised the faith in some grave way. Now there, you know, it is not unthinkable and I don't, I can't mention any names other than Bishop Mendes himself who have expressed to me their doubts, but you know if things keep going the way they're going in the church today, it is not entirely inconceivable that there, but that there will be bishops in the future who will come forward and say well, this we cannot do. We cannot go beyond this point. We have to recognize that there is a grave problem, and the grave problem is at the head. And you, you cannot say that, that this will not happen in the future, that this cannot happen in the future, when you look at the situation in the church today. Uh, you're talking about the uh, one of I've been quoted uh, as having said something. What am I supposed <laughs> to have said? You said that the situation in the church today varies from country to country. Mm. Some are more liberal and... Some are, some, are more, some are more modest, in, 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 uh, more, modest. more orthodox. Yes, yes. Okay. I would. This was my point. I I see. I see. Yes, but my, my point was that um, what people are quoting some other Bellman and so on. Okay, Bellman and Samuel Francis never suggested that God could ever permit the kind of situation to arise which you fathers are saying has arisen. Namely, not only does the Pope lapsed from the faith. But also, there are not sufficient, and you're saying, well, maybe the one or the Bishop Mendes, or one or two here and there who may be able, who don't, maybe have doubts about John Paul II's mm -hmm. status. But the point is, nobody can deny that the overwhelming majority of all the bishops in the world, whatever their theological status on the spectrum, the overwhelming majority who profess to be Catholic bishops of either East or West, recognize John Paul II as Pope, and therefore, are not doing the slightest thing about planning or doing something to replace him or depose him or something like that. You're, you're postulating a situation has arisen in which the Pope has defected and a moral unanimity, let's say, now for, for 20 years or so, of all the bishops of the Church have failed to recognize him as a false Pope and they are, they, therefore have done nothing and are doing nothing to elect a true Pope. Nothing in any of, the, any of the fathers and doctors' writings suggests that they ever admitted that that kind of situation had arrived. I'm pretty sure, especially after listening to the quote that Bishop Kelly uh, gave us a while ago, that if they envisaged the possibility of a pope defecting from the faith, they would have also been taken for granted, well, if that did happen, then rapidly this would be, um, a new pope would be elected to replace the heretical one because the papacy as, as, as such there must be this continuous, uh, the rock by, I don't see, the, the rock of the papacy had to be continuous. Once we're getting into 15, 20, 30 years, uh, I don't see how that's... Father, they didn't put a time limit on it, nor did they say it would have to happen rapidly. I mean, the very, the very recognition of the fact is something that might take a while to seep in, especially when it's so insidious. But when all I have to go on is by the consequences that are happening to Catholic people. There's a terrible disease. This is worth an Ebola. 
that is attacking well, the Catholic Well, yeah, okay, but, but by the way, that happened also in the fourth that century. St. Yeah. Robert Bellarmine and St. Alphonsus Liguori did not envision a scenario such as we consider a possibility. That's all we're suggesting. It's possible. You're acting and, on that possibility as, on the presumption that it's true because you omit his name well, from the canon. All, all, well, I'm not in, I believe that if I say I'm in communion with John Paul and he is publicly in communion with Hans Kuhn and recognizes him as a Roman Catholic priest, who has the same faith that he had, that I would be telling a lie because yes. I would be saying that I am communion with this heretic, as you yourself well, consider him to be a heretic. I think this is a necessary consequence of being in communion with somebody. Mm -hmm. But but regardless, who could say that St. Robert Bellum or St. Alphonsus Liguori could envision this happening to the Church? Who could, in, who could say that they would envision the Church being in this condition today? We're dealing with a set of circumstances which uh, they gave no indication of even recognizing it as being possible. But the facts are what they are. We have to face the facts. Well, now, St. Alphonsus and St. Robert Bellarmine were well aware of uh, church history. and they, they knew that at the time of the Arian crisis, I'd say things were just as bad as they are now in regard to the very divinity of Christ. Uh, Count Capone knows more about church history than I do. Perhaps you might like to comment, Count, about the previous disasters in the history of the church. This is not the first time we've oh, many. had a grave emergency, and the Aryan crisis being the most the notable crisis. example. It's a, it's a very, very obvious example where the whole church defected, and uh, Liberius, Pope Liberius, uh, Liberius uh, well, uh, was coerced, at least in was coerced into signing the excommunication against Athanasius, because the trick was to, uh, uh, they couldn't, uh, they would have found too much resistance in proposing a semi-Aryan semi formula, so they turned it, uh, asking simply for the excommunication of Athanasius, which is tantamount to approving the semi or semi-Aryan or even then Aryan formula. Did he seek to be Pope as well? No, he did not. On what grounds was, was Athanasius excommunicated by Liberia? I don't, don't know. Grounds, no, no I don't know. I don't know what grounds he was excommunicated. Obviously, uh, some grounds had to be. He, he was excommunicated. <laughs> if he was in fact excommunicated on disciplinary grounds for being recalcitrant. I think so. Which I was. Think, not, I think the excommunication was not an endorsement of well. heresy. I think, but I'm not sure. I know that the trick was at the Council of Milan, as uh, the Emperor uh, Constantius realized immediately that not all bishops would sign a semi-Aryan formula, mm -hmm. to uh, um, uh, ask them to uh, sign uh, an, the excommunication against an exam, uh, Athanasius, which would have been equivalent to accepting a semi-Aryan formula. The bishops realized that that would be the consequence, but uh, they signed all the same. Liberius was arrested, uh, um, shall we say, uh, secretly. I mean, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, so that people didn't know he was arrested. He was arrested, and uh, because he refused to sign, he was taken to the Black Sea and, uh, and put in the hands of, a, of an Aryan bishop as his, as his jailer. And after a while, uh, he failed and signed. Well, obviously, it was under duress. I don't think that would have had any, I, I don't think you could call Liberius a heretic in any way. No, no one has suggested that he was. No, no, Liberius was not a heretic. He was certainly, he was certainly a coward, and he certainly mm -hmm. wasn't fit for the job, but that's a completely different affair. But uh, quite apart from Liberius himself, the point was that at a certain time, the majority of the so-called Catholic bishops were either the promoting majority, or permitting Arianism. The majority, the older well, three bishops remained who held the faith. Right. When they were Arian heretics, did they still exercise authority over Catholics legitimately? No, but they did. Right. They fact, no, legitimately. In fact, all they did was so you're right. Could you agree with this statement? There's a reason why I'm asking. Um, addressed to the United Nations, okay. the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1965, the Catholic Church uh, aspires to be spiritually what the United Nations is in fact temporally that is the source of brotherhood of mankind well what, what could you could you say that the, the church aspires to be in the spiritual order what the United Nations is in fact in the material order 
Well, that's a v rather vague proposition, which, vague. which could be given a Catholic or an un-Catholic interpretation. Okay. 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 I think should give us a break. Yeah, there's one question. Okay. Sorry about this one point. Going back to Canada law and the, the idea that the Protestants are now in a certain circumstance can receive communion. And it was my understanding that President said by President Pope, and I think that would be an influence on Father Kelly's decision. I know what I'm getting now. If it could be established that that's not so, that by the well, in fact, permitted this through the Holy Office, and what I understand from the Count, who has a degree, the doctor now, in fact, one of the three judges in Rome. No, 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 no. I'm, a, I'm one of the judges at the local tribunal in Rome. <laughs> right. Okay, so what I'm going to promote it to. Someone in authority. I'm trying to understand now. If this is true that Pius XII did this, that he in fact uh, set the precedent, and if the Holy Office, if the Count is right, that that, that would be universal, then we have to follow that you have to have a lot of problems with Pius XII. Well, but I think before you start speculating, we should produce the document. Um, <laughs> because uh, we're speculating about something that may or may not have happened. I don't think it happened. We're drawing on hypothesis. The point is that if this document exists, so I understand that it does. But let's just, well, if it does, will that uh, influence your decision making in any way? It will influence my it will influence my opinion of Pius the Twelfth. If Pius the Twelfth approved of sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament, then he should be condemned for it. But if Pius the Twelfth approved of sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament, I'm not going to say therefore it's okay that John Paul II approved of sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament. But was, in other words, it, it doesn't make the position of the code better, it makes the position of Pius XII worse, if in fact he did it, and I don't believe he did it. Well, uh, I think... In fact, I'm quite sure he did it. Yeah, okay, well, there's a difference. But following your line, he would cease to have been ceased to, he would have ceased to be Pope from that moment. Only, only if it constituted the promulgation of universal law. But that is the universal law of the Church. Yeah, that's the way well, I follow well, well then otherwise, otherwise, the Church is defectible. Well, see, no, because if the Church can promulgate universal law, it is evil and destructive, the church is not holy. Well, that's, that's the whole well, question. If the church is not holy, she loses, uh, no, I you know... No, I understand your premise. So I'm going to this tomorrow. Yeah. In fact, right. well, this president, okay, <laughs> if he did, to so prove that he did, and the holy office, as the count says, would rep you know, represent the universality of it, then that would, that would be problematic for me if I were in your position, saying that, you know, this is, this is what uh, brought me to the conclusion, <clears throat> you know, that well, that our present Holy Father is not Pope. Well, uh, I think you're misunderstanding that. Yeah, that's well, I don't. I don't think yeah. that's I mean, that's part, the only point. Yeah, there's one part. point that was brought up at the very beginning. But Howard, for two thousand years, the Catholic Church, the laity, the priests, the bishops, the popes, have always held that the Holy Eucharist is a sacrament of unity, and that only those who are actually members of the Church can receive it. Now suddenly, 2,000 years later, we're being told that it's okay to give Holy Communion to those who are not members, actual members of the Catholic Church. You can give it to people who are heretics, schismatics, people who have a different, totally different concept of morality. But what I'm saying to you, what I'm saying to you is that from a simple, practical point of view, this is a new gospel. This is a new faith and a new religion that would be condemned as her heretical by St. Pius. Well, that's, 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 a that's a radical. The point. You haven't established that it would have been essential a alteration of what Catholics always believed and held and professed. Not and it's that simple. Not necessarily as revealed truth. That's the point. They did not lay down that, that as revealed truth. Mm -hmm. that did they always that? believe it? That it was divinely revealed that the Holy Eucharist is a sacrament of unity yes. and that you must be a Catholic to receive it? No. Not, You're wrong. not, no, no, not, not. They never Absolutely said. Absolutely wrong. They never said that it's divinely revealed truth. They said that there can never be any making, exception. You're no way. A distinction, not to clarify, but to obscure. The Catholic Church has always held that the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of unity, and that to receive it worthily, you must be a member of the Church and in the state of grace. In fact, the Council of Trent said that infallibly in one of its can its canons that you have to have the faith and be in a state of grace. The church has always held it. Now, if you want to say we're going to change what the church has always held, 
I would say that that would be a more upfront and honest way of approaching it. The council is trend. a new teaching, a new doctrine, and it was con it would be condemned by the popes for two thousand years. Yeah, but the same pope, new religion. I, I don't well, believe. The same pope, though, wouldn't you have to the same thing about Pius the Pope? Well, I you're wrong, Father. Pius XII never gave that permission. I don't think that. It was. Show it to me. I have I have the document of Pius the Ninth. It's not on me. But I've seen that the red not about the Holy Eucharist. Not specifically about changing the, the subject. Eucharist. No, I'm not changing the subject at all. I'm just trying you to are. No, uh, no, because you're a father. It's a simple, it's a simple fact of sacraments within we, the church by somebody who must be father. Heard. Father, we we have a radical, uh, yeah. a, a radical difference here with regard to our understanding of the Blessed Sacrament. I believe it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ as you do, and I believe it is the sacrament of unity that only those who are actually members of the Catholic Church can receive it. To give it to those who are not actually members is a sacrilege against the Blessed Sacrament and promotes the heresy of religious indifferentism. And that is what the Church would always say. But always go back, we would go round round and circle. Well, Father Harris, can, can, can you provide this, this document whole. sometime and send it to Father Kelly? Well, I will do my best to, I will do my best to dig it out. Okay. But I want to, what I'm saying is that the Council of Trent did not define as revealed truth that no exception can be ever made in giving communion to a non-Catholic. Just as the Church never defined that no exception to abortion is permissible. But we know no exception. The two, you don't cases, have to, the two Father, cases are not parallel. Father, you don't have to cover every single individual case. It's impossible to do that. No, the, the two cases are not parallel because abortion, the state of the magisterium on abortion is whether it's revealed truth or merely a matter of natural law, it is infallibly taught that there can be never any exceptions to the uh, the rule that abortion is always wrong. Yeah, my question but to be you, Father, was where was that defined? infallibly defined? By the, ordin by the ordinary magisterium. By the universal ordinary, ordinary magisterium. Yeah, but, yes, but, Father, but not necessarily as revealed truth. That's the point. I'm going by Lumen Gentium 25. When a moral unanimity of the bishops around the world teach in unity with the Roman pontiff that such and such a doctrine is definitely to be held. It doesn't say to be held as revealed truth. It says to be held. Then this is infallible. And that's clearly and obviously the case with regard to abortion. It's infallible church teaching by the ordinary magistrate. No exception. With no exceptions, but it's not necessarily defined as revealed truth. The point about being in heresy is that to be a heretic, you have to do more than d deny something which is infallibly taught. It has to be infallibly taught as revealed truth. And this is the precise point which has not been laid down no, regarding Father, giving you, communion to non -Catholics. In other words, are you saying that it is not the infallible teaching of the Church, even assuming it's not divinely revealed? by the universal ordinary magisterium. Are you saying that it is not the teaching of the Church that the Holy Eucharist can only be given to Catholics? I prescind from that, and all I insist on is that it is not the teaching of the Catholic Church, and never has been, that it is revealed truth that no exception can ever be made in giving communion to a non-Catholic. That's all I insist on, and that is sufficient to exculpate John Paul II from the charge of being a heretic and therefore no true pope. And of course, it has been done in relation to abortion, sterilization, euthanasia. What has been what you're saying, but, but there's no exception that the universal ordinary mm -hmm. interfering with the church has made. Yes, them. absolutely. So there can be no exception on those things. Yeah. yeah. But because there's no exception on that, doesn't necessarily mean there's no. There can be no exception on on a, on a, on a, on, a, on a question like that, as 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 oh, yeah, revealed truth. Disagree very profoundly. Well, that's the point. In 2,000 years, have we ever had a pope that was a persistent heretic? Does anybody else no. know point to? We only had a pope on Aureus the First, who uh, more or less agreed to a, a proposition by the Archbishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch, on the one will of Christ, uh, on the one will of Christ, and he agreed to it and was condemned by the Third Council of Constantinople for having agreed to it, but he was already dead. But you, you couldn't really call Honorius I a formal heretic. He was condemned as aider and begetter of heresy, but not as heretic. Well, but he was excommunicated by the Church subsequent to his... He death. was anatomized by the Third Vatican, the Third Council of Constantinople. But in the formula of an ana anatomization, he was described... Now, Clark is making the point here that 
those conditions simply do not obtain at the time of the um, the promulgation of the new rite of ordination because even though they did remove a great many very unfortunate and scandalously in my opinion they did remove these prayers from the old ordinal that did express the sacrifice of the mass and the sacrificial role of a priest very clearly nevertheless they did retain some indicate for instance i pointed out to michael davies that in the new ordinal there is a model homily at the beginning of the uh, ordinal which gives that the bishop should give in this or in other words but it's a kind of a model homily to be given by the bishop during the ordination in that model homily it very clearly specifies the offering of the holy sacrifice of the mass as the essential function of the ordained priest so uh, they at least left that in. And quite apart from that, you have the historical context of the new Catholic ordinal promulgated in 1968. This was the same year as Pope Paul VI's credo of the people of God, in which the sacrifice of the Mass and transubstantiation, transubstantiation uh, are very clearly reaffirmed. It came only three or three years after the encyclical Mysterium Fide, in which Paul VI again reaffirmed the Orthodox doctrine of the Eucharist. In other words, the historical and literary context of the new mass provides the authentic interpretation for the doctrine of the Eucharist, which is to, must be understood in the new Catholic ordinal. May I also say another thing, Father? Very often the reformers, however bad they may be, were acting through an excessive love for archaeology. They eliminated anything that... When you say the reformers, you mean the modern reformers, modern reformers. Not, not Cranmer. Not Cranmer, no. I mean the modern reformers. They eliminated, I had it from a literature's tools, obviously very close to them, they eliminated everything that uh, uh, was added after the 6th century, or the 4th, or the 5th century. So that uh, many of these formulas uh, uh, have a later date. They were introduced when the knowledge of these sacraments became more uh, deeper the deep of our knowledge of theology and new formulas were added. They, they eliminated all that for, just for the love of archaeology. <clears throat> well, they also had a... If, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I think you're right. the, it's the, the ordinal of, Leo, of St. Leo the Great that we have... We, they, yes, they, have they, they, they wanted to, in some cases, go back to the ancient form just because they were ancient. Yes, simply because whether, whether or, uh, not without taking into account the legitimate and fruitful developments in theology exactly. which had added some new prayers in the course exactly. of time in, in this right and particularly in the mass the, the opposite this, if i'm not if i'm not wrong is the ordinal of saint leo the great no yes uh, yes the leonine the leonine that's Catholic. what michael davies says in an appendix here well that might have been the intentions of some of them that was the stated intentions of some of them but not all but the there, were, there were others, there were liturgists who said we want an ecumenical liturgy. Yes, that will be okay to refer to the where archaeologists. And this is, uh, this is part of the problem. This is what they want. Yes, but I think the majority were archaeologists. That may be so, but the product is something that is not intrinsic. Yes, but, oh, you know but, what you just said, Father? If, if we take the words of Father uh, Clark here, who is a great authority, and I, I acknowledge that, um, is he actually admitting, therefore, that the, the new order, because it is so pared down, is not intrinsically Catholic, that it does not have an intrinsic Catholic character, but it is only in the context of the larger picture that extraneously it must be interpreted in the Catholic sense? No, I don't think he's saying that at all, because the essential form within the new rite is so is practically the same as the, tr the, the essential form in the old rite, with very, well, this, the point you just raised a while ago, which doesn't seem to me very substantial at all. Practically speaking, it's, it's with the exception of, of one word, ut, which was deleted from the new version, with the exception of that, it's exactly the same essential form as the traditional rite of math, which was certainly an intrinsically valid Catholic um, form for the for the ordination of a priest. So uh, Clark is not saying in any way that the, that the, uh, the new rite is not intrinsically Catholic and needs to have an, a Catholic meaning extrinsically imposed on him. No, I, I understood that that was actually what he said. No, saying. no, he doesn't say that. He said, he said, he said it's unfortunate. It's heterodox because of the context in which it was brought in. 
Well, if that is the only reason why it cannot be considered no. heterodox, what he's saying is that I think he's, itself, it, it would be heterodox. I think he's taking for granted that the form itself is an intrinsically valid form because it's exactly the same, it will practically the same as the, as the precon, the preconciliar traditional one. He's simply answering the objection that because they remove many of these uh, other prayers which are not part of the intrinsic form, so this somehow calls into question the validity of the right. He, he's, because he's saying that there's no parallel between the reform of Cranmer and the reform of Paul VI because the same conditions do not hold. Um, he's not saying in any way that the right itself are not intrinsically Catholic. Sounds to me like what he's saying is that there are real problems. That the reason you cannot make the same judgment about the new right as you made about the Anglican right because of the external context. I mean, otherwise, what he says doesn't make any sense. No, that's not that's not the case. He's uh, he's not in any way calling in question that the right itself is intrinsically a valid. The, the essential form of the sacrament is intrinsically valid and 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 Catholic. How could he but when it's practically a, the same thing as does the he old one? Doesn't actually say anything about the form. Then. But he doesn't it's say what you're attributing it to either. No, no, be, no because, because he is addressing one particular objection. He's saying, according to Davies' book, the first edition, the omission of these external uh, forms, the omission of, omission of these external, external to the essential form, that is, the omission of these surrounding prayers expressing the, the sacrifice of the man, supposedly casts doubt on the validity of the right. Now, Clark is simply saying, the reason why Leo XIII used that argument in regard to Anglican order was because, I mean, the thing is, not, not even the Anglican rite in itself, if you took it in isolation, it uses the word receive the, the um, whatever it is, for the office and work of a priest or a bishop, as the case may be. Leo XIII himself admitted that taken in isolation, in itself, even the, Ang even the, 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 the form in the Anglican um, rite could be a valid form of ordination. And the reason it was not was because the word priest and the word bishop had to be understood in the light of the surrounding historical and literary context, which we know was specifically designed to exclude the Catholic notion of priest and, and, and bishop. And all Clark is saying here is that um, the reason Leo XIII gave for denying the validity of Anglican orders uh, there is no parallel with that in the new order. That's why he's emphasizing the question of these surrounding prayers. And he's not re referring specifically to the, the essential form itself. But in no way is he casting doubt on the fact that the essential form itself is, uh, is a Catholic one. Well, again, Father, we could uh, discuss yeah. the interpretation of that for a long time. But it sounds as though he's saying that because the prayers were taken out, the charge could be made that this is a heterodox rite, and the reason why it should not be called heterodox is not because of the intrinsic nature of the rite, but because of the historical context. Yeah, that, that's what it seems. No, I think, I, think, one. No, I think you're reading more into it than I right. Moving along to, from liturgy to canon law, the sacrament of matrimony and the marriage tribunals. It has been reported that among the followers of the Society of St. Pius X, some have erected their own marriage tribunals to investigate and presumably to judge situations where a previously married party is seeking to enter a new marriage. What authority would such a parallel tribunal have, either in reviewing a previously granted annulment or in granting a new one? None. No authority whatsoever. <clears throat> Any other views? Would they agree with that? Agreed, absolutely. Right. Um, in the past, that is before the Second Vatican Council, what has been the official position of the Church regarding the duties of a pastor towards someone who may have obtained an annulment either in error or through fraud? That's for the pastor to answer. <laughs> but I would say that the book, I am sure that that annulment had been obtained through false witnesses, false testimony, and I was sure of it. I might, I might, uh, well, refuse the communion publicly to the person in question. That would 
cause a scandal. I might not uh, know, uh, it might not be known, but it had been obtained falsely. I mean, that's, those well, are all yes, val see. evaluations to be made by the pastor. Suppose an annulment is granted. One of the parties remarries in the church, let's say a perfectly innocent man or woman who naturally knows nothing about this. Years later, while this new uh, union has been working successfully maybe with several new children of the new union, years later it comes to light that there was fraud or some kind of um, illicit procedure in granting this annulment. Frankly, I'm, I'm not a, a specialist in canon law, I've never had to even in confront theory, that si situation in, in, in pastoral practice, and since I didn't know that I was going to be involved in this in two days ago, <laughs> I've had no opportunity to research it. But, uh, and so I can't give uh, off the cuff like this what, what has been the traditional, traditional practice or policy of the church on a thing like that. But I do know, uh, this is just an off the cuff opinion, that uh, in certain cases, traditional moral theology has recognized there can be cases in which a confessor can leave somebody uh, in ignorance. If there's an objective, leave someone in good faith when there is a, if there's something objectively against the law of the church has been done. But if the confessor prudently judges that uh, if this is revealed to the penitent, it could actually make the situation worse, that the person is not going to uh, change from the situation that they're in. There are some situations where traditional moral theology has said that um, you can leave a person sort of where ignorance is bliss. If they're in good faith now and they are uh, in a situation where subjectively, at the moment they're innocent, where this woman who, he was in, she's been married in church, she has every um, reason to believe that she is in a, in a perfectly valid and holy Catholic marriage, I think you could make out a case, if this was a truly occult, a very secret piece of information that came to light about how this annulment had been gained by fraud or bribery or something like that, rather than um, break up a union in which the people are subjectively in good faith and all, in all probability in the state of grace, I think you'd make a good case for leaving that the innocent person in the dark there. Let's see if being does Rather than revealing it and causing a great crisis of conscience, possibly leading that person to persevere in the illicit union knowing it's illicit, in which case they would lapse from the state of grace in which they've been in up to now. Uh, it's a very delicate situation, but um, as I say, I'm just offering an off-the-cuff no, right. first opinion on that, and I wouldn't like to be thought that I'm that this is definitely the practice. As I have had no time to research, but I mean, this has yeah. happened also um, publicly, may I say, cases of natural law, where the interpretation of natural law has been changed by the Holy See, it can happen. Uh, not that the Holy See had, had made any pronouncement beforehand, but between some pronouncement of uh, some uh, opinion on natural laws followed by the rotor. And as I was, uh, I was saying this morning, an opinion for a natural law different, an opposite opinion in canon, in natural, all natural in, in law followed by the Holy Office. Office. The Holy See decides for the Holy Office, for the opinion of the Holy Office. It would mean mm -hmm. that all the cases that have been solved, resolved, solved by the rotor would have to be re-examined. Non sunt incomodanti was the answer. They were left as they are. I, I do think that you're right, Father, that there are cases in which the traditional moral theologians would say that you could leave a person in good faith. Under certain circumstances, and I think each case would have to be judged individually. But I really think that the problem that we face in the practical order, the problem that we face, is that between 1968 and 1988, the number of annulments in the United States has increased 18,000%. In the course of 20 years. So we face a lot of instances in which people come forward and they claim, well, they do have it, uh, the document of an annulment. And you begin to examine it and look at it and determine that, objectively speaking, from the point of view of the doctrinal teaching of the church concerning the indissolubility of marriage, 
that there were no grounds for the Noma. Actually, that what? brings us to the next... Why don't they appeal to the Rota? Soon get that righted. Well, generally speaking, the people want the Noma. Oh. You know? In other words, so they, they go to where they... But the, 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 the defender of the managed mm -hmm. bond is where he's lacking his, yes. his, 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 his defective in his duty. In, uh, in an if an individual priest does not trust the decision rendered in an element process, can he oblige a couple to furnish the documentation? No. He cannot? Jane? I disagree with that. <clears throat> the reason I disagree with it is because of the increase, the 18,000 percent increase between 68 and 88. Many of these annulments are quite evidently and quite clearly illegitimate annulments. There are people who are in valid marriages, consummated valid Christian marriages, have been yeah, what, effect dissolved. What, what I hear you say. But who has the right to judge them? Right to they absolutely do not have the right to trust the local tribunals in this country, in the United States. I would certainly say that. But, but the they have not fact, the there was a there was a. Uh, I believe a Monsignor on the Brooklyn <coughs> Tribunal who said there is no marriage that I cannot annul. Give it enough time. Sir. Give it enough time. I mean, yes, I, I know, but what authority? I, I quite agree with you. The American, ca the American, the, the situation, the, the, the case of America is a scandal in the Universal Church. We all, well, we're all talking about it in Rome. I mean, you know, it's a known fact. And, and the Rota case, I don't say the Rota delights in saying no when it, the cases are brought to its attention, but I mean, that would not be even pastoral nor charitable. But at least, I mean, you know, uh, the tendency is. Uh, but uh, the question is what authority does is the individual part of what knowledge of canon law, of matrimonial law, and what authority does he have in rejudging the case? Yeah, this is not I whatsoever. Think that's, that's true. I, I don't think. think it's a question of rejudging the case, I think it's a question of a blatant nonconformity to the teaching of the Catholic Church on annulments. Someone says, I was married in a Catholic ceremony, the marriage was consummated, and I went to the local tribunal and I got the, annulled, I got the marriage annulled because I was only 21 when I got married, for example, and therefore I did not have... The there, may be changing. there may be cases attested, attested by... Uh, by Periti by ex uh, expert witnesses, in which uh, you can have cases of immaturity, even at 21. It depends on the case. It depends. I, 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 I don't know if I can, I can speak of the case I was, I was entrusted with. Uh, uh, the president of the tribunal in Florence called me and said, uh, Avocato Caponi, you're going to take this case on a legal aid basis. Now, you know perfectly well that it an advocate is called by the president of the tribunal and is asked to take a legal aid case, he cannot refuse. He can't say, no, I don't like the case. He has to accept. And I was faced with a case of immaturity of a girl, 24. Uh, I, I was perplexed, but I carried, I did my duty. And uh, we had the expert witness. I filed in my pleadings uh, on the basis of the expert witness's report, and I won the case. And then I went to the psychiatrist, and I said, look here, uh, I had this case, I won the case, it was a case of a girl who had been brought up in a very, uh, you know, what I would call one of the Catholic saints, you know, one of these sort of rather, um, well, associations where they are all very holy and they are so holy that, that they, they lose all practical uh, sense of reality. and. Uh, uh, I can't give you the name of the association, I can't give it to you. But uh, uh, she'd been given the facts of life, she was told what happened, but uh, the first night was a disaster, she continued to vomit, uh, to faint, uh, heart attacks, uh, all, the, all, all, all the gamut, for six years. And uh, 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 you're in serious danger of her health, all through. And then uh, the case came to court, and uh, the, 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 the um, analysis in the report of the expert listeners was that she had been brought up in this unreal and rarefied atmosphere, and that uh, she had the, that the the knowledge she had that really not penetrated into her, and therefore because she had been kept back, she'd been kept back in mature. You see, so I asked, apart from the specific case, 
I asked Socrates, I said, why is it? Now, my question was very simple. Why is it that an, that an illiterate shepherd of southern Italy of 150 years ago, at the age of 18, was mature enough to marry? And here I have a girl, 34, agreed that there was a special condition, who was not capable because of immaturity. And he gave me this answer. He said, apart from permissiveness, which of course retards maturity, that's what parents don't realize when they, when they give in. Every time they give in, they keep the child back. Uh, the other reason is that, children, that young people today are bombarded by, apart from the grown new neurosis that is pervading all society, all Western society, they are bombarded by information. And until they assimilate that information, this huge amount of contradictory, very often contradictory information, they do not achieve maturity. The shepherd you mentioned had only two or three notions to assimilate. Once he assimilated that, psychologically he was mature. So there's every reason to uh, accept uh, such a uh, uh, conclusion. In other words, uh, a pastor without a specialized knowledge of canon law and without juridical competence and and I, I don't, psychology of psychiatry, yeah, that kind of thing. I, I don't see how Bishop Kelly has the authority to look at the annulment papers and say, "Well, look, I'm not going to accept, accept this," and, and such a person is. Uh, I mean, let's say nine times out of ten, you may in fact be right that the annulment was gra gra wrongly granted, but the other one time out of ten you won't be. But, but more important, uh, where is the juridical competence to make a decision about that? I mean, I, I, I don't see that. The question of juridical competence is a question of common sense and what the church teaches. The Catholic Church teaches that a marriage, uh, that the Christian marriage is indissoluble, and if people dissolve marriage, in the case that the Falk gave, it's a very complicated case. But the might ordinarily speaking, for example, I know cases where someone got married at the age of 20, and they later got an annulment. And I asked them, well, what was it? And they said, well, you know, I was immature. And the tribunal gave me an annulment because I was immature at the age of 20. Was there, were there two expert witnesses, one for the one for the starting the case and one an official one who would then uh, certify this? Were the expert witnesses, uh, do they, do, because another, another, another condition is that the expert witness should not have opinions contrary to Catholic uh, theology and philosophy as to, as to personal mm -hmm. responsibility etc 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 well to my knowledge there were not there may have been but i do know cases of annulments being granted on the request of one person and the other person gets a notice in the mail your marriage is annulled and to a policeman from long island no, you see the that, document that, that, under that, some circumstances that that might be quite correct well no, it? no it's a procedural error oh procedurally, the party ought to be informed that uh, the, the one party has filed, uh, has filed a request for nullity. The other party yeah. must be informed. But they can sometimes be, be granted an annulment even without testimony Some, being heard of the other party. Well, the, the, the other party must be notified yeah. that the request okay. has been filed. The other party must say if it agrees or not, yeah. and then is, is, is asked to come and, uh, and, and, give, uh, and give witness on the case. Well, we've already acknowledged that the system here in the United States is a farce. And it's a tragic farce. And we are left with the practical problem. And we are teaching our young people that matrimony is indissoluble, according to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And most of what passes for annulments in this country are frauds. They are actually divorces. Nothing more or less than that. And uh, we cannot overturn the universal law of the church, which is that matrimony enjoys the favor of law, knowing that the vast majority of these annulments are frauds, and expect our young people to honor the indissolubility of the marriage bond. It is really a moral question more than a canonical question. We're thinking about the souls of the people. In yes, but uh, uh, you're, you're caught between two fires. Back to the practical aspect of it is, um, in the cases we were talking about, 
Is the priest allowed to refuse the sacraments to either party in the married couple if he suspects that Frosis may have been abused? No. My bottle can no. I, I don't think he... In my situation, what I would do, if I, there's a couple who I suspect of having gained an annulment that was undue, I don't mean by fraud necessarily, but it was given on sufficient grounds, I would not feel competent to, even if I had strong suspicions that it wasn't uh, correctly done, that was not my decision. It is not up to me to refuse commune to those people. The responsibility lies with the bishop of the tribunal who allows certain judges or advocates or officials there. It is not up to me to make that decision. I will give them communion if they are otherwise you know, disposed and fulfill the other conditions even if I suspect that this was not uh, a, a correctly given annulment, because it's not up to me to make that decision. And I'm responsible for, before God uh, for a certain area of competence as a pastor in a parish with the souls committed to me. Other people are responsible before God, and especially the bishop, for the annulments that are granted. It's not up to me to make the decision to refuse communion to someone on the basis of a decision which I, as a simple pastor, have no competence to make. Would you... Father, what if there is... A I agree with you. Perception among the people that this is a fraud, and that it would be scandalous for you to countenance this fraud. Would you still feel that you should bow to... What you I, would, I, would, I, I, I would... I would... If, if people express that sense of scandal to me, I would explain what I've just explained here, that it may well be invalid, but that is not my decision to make. That is up to the bishop and his tribunal, and I have to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I've explained to the people that uh, uh, that's the way they should approach it too, that it is not up to them or to me to make a decision or a judgment as to whether A and B are truly married or not. Uh, that's up to the bishop and his tribunal. And, uh, and you would not feel responsibility if, if you feared that this example might encourage other members of your flock to think that they could get annulments too, for other reasons that you also would find uh, acceptable and could come up with a procedurally uh, wrong decision that would uh, issue in what you think would be a wrong decision. If it did have that bad effect, that would not be my responsibility, because I am not the one who is competent to judge the validity of that marriage. But, but don't you think that is failing the people? I mean, I don't think I'd be failing the consider people. Consider what the, if that, if, no, the souls if, of the people and the concept they have if, of if, the matrimonial bond. If that is the situation, and if people's souls are being endangered by it, that is not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the bishop of the diocese or whoever the competent authority is for that tribunal. But if he's yeah. making a joke of the matrimonial bond, that is his responsibility before God. The only thing you can do is deliver a sermon to your church. All, all I have to do is... The, the sanctity of marriage. I, I, all I can do is say publicly, as I'm saying, if this becomes public now, that I deplore, as you do, the gross negligence that is evident, and, and the Pope himself and, and Cardinal Silvestrini, whoever is in charge of the... Uh, the rota, is it? Uh, or when uh, he was, or the... Uh, the he's moved on. He's or the penitentiary or something. Like, but it's it, it, uh, yeah. Augustonian. Okay, but... I mean, a bit it, it, it is a notorious fact that a few years ago, it was something like 80% of all the annulments in the world came from North America. There's obviously, in effect, the two standards of, of church, in, in practice, two, a double standard of, of doctrine on marriage, one for America and Ca North America and United States and Canada, another one for the rest of the world. That is scandalous. Oh, I would may I say also that there were cases coming this side, coming from Italy, this side of the Atlantic, yeah. to get the analogy at, in, in, in the Brooklyn well, Court. Right. I mean, it, it, I would say to my people uh, that you know, this is a scandalous situation. I deplore the fact that annulments are given out so easily. I would warn the people saying, do not feel confident but just because this tribunal gives you an annulment, that that is necessarily going to be invalid before God, I would, I would warn people along those lines if I realize that here I'm in a situation with all these nullities being given, that I would not feel competent to refuse any specific couple Holy Communion uh, on the grounds that this is going beyond my competence. And if there is scandal being caused, I am not the cause of that scandal. I'd like to know if the Church ever canonized a priest for taking that course of action. 
Because, well, that may seem like an inordinate question. That that, but nonetheless, I mean, when you look back to times of crisis, it, it all it seems, according to my limited knowledge of hagiography, that the church has always canonized those who stood for the truths of the faith, the integrity of the sacraments, and and not those who simply said it's not my responsibility. That sounds like washing the church. No, it's not washing my hands of something. If I am not, in fact, and in church law, responsible for something, I am in no way uh, violating the, God, the will of God or the law of the church by acting on, on that premise. I mean, uh, Would you I, washing, washing, let, let, just, 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 just a minute, please. You're talking about washing my hand. That comes from Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the guy who did have competence to decide whether our Lord would be put to death or not. And so when he washed his hands, that was a, a, a dereliction of duty on his part, because he was in fact the, le the one legally competent to decide our Lord's death. The whole point of what I'm saying is that I'm not the one legally competent to decide whether a given couple, whose nullity may well be suspect, uh, was in fact... Uh, um, in, invalidly granted to them, and so that I have the authority to deny them Holy Communion. So I'm not actually, washing my hands. I do not have the competence to make that decision. We're talking about two different things here, actually, I realize that. We're talking about legal competence and moral responsibility. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of moral responsibility. I have a moral responsibility not to go beyond my juridical and legal competence in the Church. I don't see a conflict between those two things. Can I say two things? Number one is we both deplore the abuse of marriage we find in the world. The second thing I'd like to say is I, I think... more in this country than the rest of the world. This country, and I think we should end. Because we're over time, and we have I to I would go. agree. Uh, Do you agree? Questions? Are there any questions from the audience? We'll take five minutes of questions. Take a limited number of questions. Sure. Questions, maybe then... Uh, well, I came late, and from what I understand, my question might be uh, I wanted to talk about the desperation of Bishop Kelly and the difference between uh, validity and lucidity. Uh, but from what I understand, everyone recognizes that uh, Bishop Kelly is, in fact, a validly consecrated bishop. I think that's true. At least that's what some of the folks are in break. That everyone agrees to that, there's no objections to that. Whereas you might hold the uh, consecration uh, not legal, you accept that he is uh, uh, not legal. That's fine, I think that's so. Okay. All right. Uh, I think some of us have confidence for that. But that has not been. Okay, then maybe I should ask my question. Sure. All right. Uh, I think we have to look at it. The validity of the consecration and whether it was legal or not. I would assume that most people there would say that it was not legal. Uh, a lot of people there would say that there's not an emergency in the church. If there's not an emergency in the church, then granted it is not legal. I can say that. However, for the validity, what you're saying, whoever does not accept the validity of Bishop Kelly, you're saying that Bishop Mendez was either senile or didn't know what he was doing or was coerced by the priest of the society. And that is a very, very brave thing to say. Is my assumption right? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I just want to make a comment about me. The proceeding thus far, and uh, maybe it was cliche, but I feel like I've stepped with looking glass because I feel like I'm in Wonderland. For the past four hours, we've heard essentially the Pope, probably not the Pope, or dubious, and dubious pontificate. We've heard that virtually all of the hierarchy has affected, which is why, of course, they don't recognize Father well, Jenkins. They should tell you there was a Pope, and it's really not the Pope. We've heard that the Priestly ordination right in a dubious validity, apparently because of the word book, is my friend. And finally, we've heard the Department of Review of, of the documents of the marriage tribunal, having heard my testimony in court, having heard nothing from the expert witnesses in the party, 
They've decided that the sum of these is always representative. We've had four presumptions uh, regarding matters of ecclesiology. Every one of these presumptions has been rendered. Are you yet. addressing his question? I'd like to I'm, I'm getting to this, yes. this, this okay. particular issue by first prefacing it by saying we've had four presumptions, and every one of them has been indulged against the validity. Now, when we get to the consecration of Bishop Kelly, apparently there's going to be one presumption in favor of it. But the problem the rest of us have is that we were in present consecration. We don't indulge in that presumption. Although I believe that uh, Bishop Kelly has said that what he's concerned, if there's a doubt as to the validity of the sacrament, he presumes the sacrament is valid. I think we have the right to, to engage in to indulge in that presumption of consecration. We have doubts about the validity. Based on, what are based that? on the circumstances that I'm aware of. Are you of. speaking for yourself or I'm, I'm talking about the, at least five or six people in the room who have investigated the matter and looked at Okay, what's the right answer as far as the well, let me just finish your comment. Well looked at the transcripts of a certain court hearing in Ohio with the mental competence of the of the bishop directly implicated by the judge himself. That's false statement. Of where the judge said it appears to be that the document he signed regarding his burial it's worthless. And Do you acknowledge that's a false statement? No, I don't. The, the judge, judge explicitly in his decision said, I do not give any credit to any testimony whether he was or was not competent. He explicitly said that. What you're saying now is not true. I'm telling you that the judge reviewed a document that Bishop Mendez signed regarding his burial found it to be his opinion maybe undue influence, maybe He did not say that. that. That's not and true. Any event you are not telling the truth. My and then he got worthless because the signature was totally illegible and could not be relied upon. He said the document was worthless. Bishop designation of the burial site. Did he say there was any question? Was, no, you can't say these things when they're not true, Chris. Like they're not true. The transcript to read and record have it in the next room. And he said the document was worthless. He did not rely upon the signature of the bishop because it was totally illegible. And he definitely expressed the judicial sentiment that it was a product of undue influence, lack of capacity. What I'm saying to you, Bishop Kelly, is you say you have doubts about the Pope himself. You yeah, but I don't tell lies. You indulge. Oh, well, I, I resent that, and I'll prove in front of the truth in a moment. Well, you, you get the decision of the court. Right, I will do that. Sure. But what I'm saying is if you've indulged in, in presumptions against <clears throat> the bigger price, against the hierarchy, against the validity of the decisions of marriage tribunals, you are certainly entitled to indulge in a presumption against the validity of your consecration. Which I know for a fact referred in the bedroom in San Diego, no audio tape, no the lie, no video tape, no cooperation other than isolated photographs, and no witnesses to testify that members of the Fine Defense Society and the Bishop's secretary who was implicated in the San Diego will contest, contesting the sudden change of the bishop's will to leave everything to your organization a month and a half before he died. So uh -huh. yes, he has the right. To indulge in a presumption that your consecration is suspect. But you also I, have an obligation to be honest. I don't think you're being honest. Yeah, you're not being honest. I'm not judging on the transcript right Go ahead. now. Uh, I received the letter from Chris just shortly after the pension. And that letter started off with, I, I, I know I think this was a letter to play dead, but it started off very first sentence. Mentioning the consecration as being very, very wrong and not being valid. And this was before any proof, any investigation was made. Even though Father Jenkins and myself, and I think Father Kelly has had correspondence with them, explaining certain things, it's as if what we said went through one ear and out the other. Now Chris comes with a lot of false statements. I'm sure he thinks they're correct. Well, I'm going to correct For the record, I'm going to correct the perception you created that I lied because I have a friend right here, here and I intend to read it. Good. And this is what the judge said about the <coughs> signature on the document. No, 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 about mental competence. I'm going to, that's precisely what I'm going to say. Okay, read what he said, said about before it. before that the judge ruled Signature on the document regarding the burial was, in his view, the product of undue influence or lack of capacity. He called me a liar. You said you said that he raised questions about yes. the mental competence. Exactly. Yeah, read it. You called me a liar. Here's what the judge said. I looked at defendant's exhibit number A, 
This is the burial instruction of the alleged Mercedes, and what I believe you testified at the hearing, uh, he could not do himself if hand him the guidance across the page. <coughs> Actually, that's not true. Either. Judge said the following. I've looked at defendant's exhibit number A. Based on the fact that this proceeding was at a point where he died two days later, based on the fact that he's expressed his desire to be buried elsewhere than around the top of New York, I've looked at the signature a number of times, and for the life of me, although Father Jenkins indicated he could see the A and the L, if I didn't know his name, I could not make out what that signature was. If this were a probate court, I think the probate court may have said this was not knowingly, intelligently, voluntarily entered into. Could have been undue influence, could have been complete unappreciativeness of what he was doing, the words he was using, or anything else. Was that right judge right? for the yeah. concentration? As far as I am concerned, exhibit A, which is a document that he signed around, was well, that right before the concentration? It's of no value to the court. This was a couple of years later, okay. right? So, this is what I said to you about the testimony in Ohio. You called me a liar. I just quoted from the record the judge's perception that was undue influence or lack of capacity in the state. If you want to pursue this, we have a more lengthy trend. What, what he says, and, though, and prepared, is, is not the same as what, as what you are saying. I called a liar on the record about what I said here. I documented the judge questioned the mental competency of the vision. But, it, but it's, it's not so. He didn't, though. That's a false he interpretation of what he said. Can I read the transcript? I'll let, I'll let the transcript speak for you. Okay, up. here he said. And that, wait, but one more point. I'm prepared to drag out the rest of the transcript about the testimony of family members that nine days before this consecration, the bishop couldn't recognize his sister, that he was in a coma five days, that he almost died, that he suffered a stroke, what if that is provably unproven? I really don't appreciate being called a liar and by saying to you that there's evidence in this case which would give rise to a presumption of doubt. Just well, Chris, let me ask you. nine days before he died. Chris, I was in the hospital in October 1990. Chris, what if it is provable? It was a few days before the concentration. What if it is provable that what her sister said is not true? And I, and I trust you won't call me a liar for saying that because I'll get that transcript. No, you just say what to get you back straight. Just for the record, I want to read what the judge yeah, I, 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 And I apologize if I sound angry. I just would have appreciated, Bishop Kelly, if you had simply disagreed with me instead of calling me a liar not true. And, for, and forcing me to get the transcript. Not true. Here's what the judge said. He said there had been different opinions testified to by the various witnesses as to the bishop's mental condition. I refuse to allow them to get into any medical or psychiatric or psychological testimony because they are not qualified to do so, but they could certainly state to the court their reactions to the appearance of the bishop. Now, Bishop Kelly, now that, with all due respect, smacks of dishonesty, because what I said to you before was very limited. I said that this judge, reviewing that document, Exhibit A, said that he had questions as to the mental competency of the bishop. He didn't say that. Please let me finish. That. You said I was a liar. I just read to you from a transcript where the judge said, looking at that document, quote, could have been undue influence, could have been lack of capacity, I find the document worthless, and that's all I said to you. You just quoted from a section of the transcript that has nothing whatsoever to do with what I said. And this has been typical of the discussion for the last six hours, a constant shifting of ground. Someone objects to something you've done, you shift to another topic. I tell you the judge had a problem with Exhibit A, you talk about the testimony uh, of experts about mental health, which wasn't provided at that hearing. One thing has nothing to do with the other. I have yet to see anyone from the Pius V Society squarely object, excuse me, squarely address a single objection that's been put to them today. And this is typical, you just did it again. Gentlemen, I hope you were accurate in court. I have past fact duties to attend to, so may we conclude these proceedings. Thank you. She's also inaccurate.